This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And All today's right. guest, we've got Tim McBride. Tim, how, how are we? Yeah, I'm great. You know, it's finally good to see you, man. Yeah, it's been class, mate. It's uh, meeting each other halfway, so to speak. Yeah. You know, this is great. Yeah. One of America's biggest weed dealers in the 70s and 80s, making millions, smuggling from Colombia to Miami. Jamaica, to... Central America, all around the Caribbean. Yeah. How's life? Yeah, life's good. Life's great. Now it's good, you it's... know. After getting, you know, behind all that and finally being able to, you know, ultimately going through what I'm about to tell you, we, you know, a lot of us went through, you know, I'm blessed to still be able to have, you know, two wonderful kids. I got two grandkids now, you know, I mean, it's it could have gone very tolerably the wrong way, you mm-hmm. know, with that regard. But, um, yeah, you know, it's all had to do with where I grew up and yeah. my upbringing, you know, as a commercial fisherman down in Southwest Florida. Yeah. 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 Made millions. Lost that. Had to pay it back to get a reduced sentence in prison. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Sure. Get a bit of understanding about you, Tim, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, I was uh, born in North Carolina here in the States. My father was an 82nd Airborne. He was in the Army, paratrooper. And once he got out of the Army, we kind of hung out there. And my family is, uh, a lot of my, my earlier generational family comes from Ohio. Uh, my great, great uh, granduncle was president of the United States, President Warren G. Harding. He was a newspaper man that came out of Mansfield, Ohio. So that's kind of where the roots began. My father and my mom raised us kids in North Carolina. And then about high school area, I went to, uh, my father took a job in the Midwest. And I was, um, I did my high school years in a little town in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin, Lake Geneva, uh, tourist town kind of thing, if you will. And, um, you know, and there was really nothing dysfunctional about our family. It was just the regular, average, every ordinary, you know, American fucking family, you know, that kind of shit, you know. But, you know, it wasn't leave it to beaver shit, you know. But, you know, we were just boys, three boys growing up with the dad, you know, doing his uh, sales gig, gone all the time. And mom, you know, trying to wrangle us guys, you know, and shit. But, um, you know, we didn't turn out too bad for, you know. For, uh, you know, just being regular kids, really like regular screw-ups like everybody else, you know, kids. But we made yeah. it through high school, but... Um, what were you like at school? Uh, I surprisingly did pretty well in school, you know, with, with very little effort. I don't know, you know, where that comes from. Yeah. You know, maybe it's <clears throat> skipped a few generations that I don't know about or some shit like that, you know. But I, I know it didn't come from my grandma or my grandma's side of it because my <clears throat> great uncle uh, Warren G. Harding was... Um, was noted as running one of the most corrupt presidencies in the history of the United States, man. But barring that, you know, <laughs> my grandma telling me that story because she said, you know, when I was in prison, she wrote me and she said that um, 
you know, uh, when it comes to that, you know, sort of, you know, that branch of our family tree, most families would like to see that branch just, you know, kind of nipped off and not even, you know, and, and forgotten, she says. But, you know, facts are facts and, and things are, are what they are. And, you know, it just so happens you happen to go down that branch that your uncle went down, you know. So she never d admonished me for it. She never disowned me for it. But she helped me understand the depth to which I was, you know, getting my, you know, getting myself into trouble, which we'll get into here in a second. But, um, yeah, I just grew up like every other normal kid, man, you know. But I was always the kind of guy where, you know, if an opportunity or something felt like an opportunity, you know, came along, you know, I didn't sit around. I didn't want to be the guy that sits around later on in your life, you know, and kick yourself in the fucking ass and go, man, I wish I'd have done that. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> fuck it. I just went and did it. You know, if it sounded like something that was, you know, cool, I figured I'd jump in there and do something, you know. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and I wrote in my book, which I wish I had a copy of, but we'll we'll get a copy yeah. of it. Well, is your book for people to check it out? Yeah, the book is called Saltwater Cowboy, which is what I got right there. And it's um, The Rise and Fall of a Marijuana Empire. And it's on Amazon. And it's uh, it's available all throughout Europe. I've seen it, you know, in Spain, in Italy, France, Netherlands. People, you know, they're buying it everywhere. Second printing now, you know, because I did really well in the first edition of hardcovers, which are really rare to get right now. But um, it's it's just, you know, it's not, it, it's a story that's not ever told because the United States government is not going to tell it. They're not going to admit to how ridiculous a lot of these people that they thought were backwoods hillbilly hicks made them look like idiots and fools because of, you know, hiding in plain sight is what we were really very good at. And when you're moving the amounts that we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's hard to imagine them not being, you know, keyed in on what was going on. But moving forward from, you know, growing up in, in my family and my, you know, in my schooling and stuff, like I said, it was just normal kid stuff, you know, but I, and having, being the one taking the opportunities, like I said, as they come along. And I wrote in my book that, you know, I'm not the guy, you know, I'm not that guy standing in the back of the crowd, you know, trying to see over everybody else to see what the fuck's going on. I'm that guy elbowing my fucking way through the crowd to the front because if there's some shit going on up there, I want to on it, you know. <laughs> That's me, you know. I'm not waiting on these fucking assholes, you know. <laughs> so I kind of live my life according to that, you know, that philosophy or, or down those lines anyway. So when the opportunity presented itself, a buddy of mine, you know, is um, my next-door neighbor that I grew up with you know, through the high school years after we moved to, the, to those, that lower end of Wisconsin. We lived on a really beautiful lake, had a nice house there, and the next door neighbor was my my best friend, my bud. Well, his sister married a guy from down in Everglades, you know, from you know, a little island called Chukaluski, or actually two little islands, Everglades City and Chukaluski, linked together by a causeway, and together they make the town up the uh, the uh, up the town of Everglades City. Population at that time, and even I think even still today, and I looked it up not too long ago, just just uh, just under four hundred people. Because there's, I mean, the islands are only so big, you know what I'm saying? And they are the last stop. They're the last, very last settlement, the last thing that you get to on the southwest coast of Florida before you have to head east and go to Miami because everything below us is Everglades. So these two little islands are within what's the bound within the edge of the Nash, Everglades National Park, but they're also among the 10,000 islands is what this is called. <clears throat> and I'll offer you a picture to show, you know, our, your viewers what 10,000 islands looks like. Or you can just, you know, Google the shit or whatever they do in Scotland or wherever the <laughs> fuck they do. You know, look this shit up. You know, just look up 10,000 islands in Everglades, you know, Everglades, and they'll show you these beautiful labyrinth of literally 10,000 islands. There's 35 miles of coastline, at times five miles deep, of nothing but little labyrinths and turns. And, and it's just this beautiful labyrinth that Mother Nature saw fit to build right in our backyard, man. And this is where we fucked off and played as kids, man. You know, we run our boats around in there, you know, you know, dodging each other and shit. You know, we know these backwaters like you know your own backyard, literally, you know, in that sense. So when it comes to doing what it was that we were doing, it, we wound up being actually very good at it. And that is, um, during the early days, let's start from the beginning. Yeah, when um, you first got it, how it was done. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the beginning, there was a very cool guy, a very dear old man, and I just I had the pleasure of knowing him for a number of years before he passed in 1996. His name was uh, Lauren Brown. His nickname was Touch. 
Lauren Tosh Brown, and you can look this guy up. He's a legend in the Everglades. He's one of the originating, original founding families of the island of Chukaluski itself. And he pretty much, and, and you know, and their families, and there were several um, families that are still there. There's the Hamiltons, there's the Browns, there's the, um, the Bogguses, and, which is Mark Lee, and there's um, um, well, the Hamiltons, and you know, of, of which I speak, and um, um, and Tosh Brown, you know, um, they were there and settled this thing, they settled this little island and, and learned how to eke out and make a living when there was no way to get there other than there get their supplies and mail from sailboat from Key West. That's how they got all their shit to this little island, you know, because it was not linked to the mainland in any way. So these guys have been around forever, you know. So it's, you know, when the United States government decides that they want to expand the boundaries of their of their national park, which includes the two passes it takes to get into Everglades City and this Tuckaluskey Island. So the fishermen will have to come through what's now would be Everglades National Park, government land, to bring your catches on shore. Well, they included language that started saying, um, well, you know, now you can only catch fish so many, it's, you know, so many months out of the year, certain fish, certain size, certain size mesh on your net, which is the, the, the you know, the spacing, between, you know, um, in the webbing, you know, different size mesh and shit like that. They're putting all these restrictions on, on these people that have learned how to do this, you know, just by being there, you know, and that's the akin of taking somebody from Chicago or some assholes here from New York and drop them on, on that stretch of highway between Everglades and, and uh, Miami, which is US 41, a two lane road, you know, 120 miles, drop them off out there in the middle of that shit and say, okay, make a living. That would just be pretty much similar to what these people wound up doing figuring it out making a living and now have the government put your restrictions on them you know so Tosh back in this you know in the 60s he and Ernest Hamilton which we never got involved in you know in any of the stuff which I'm about to speak of but um, just a dear man in his own right and I acknowledge that fact in my book about him you know because he was uh, you know one of the founding guys who you know that figured out he's the one that figured out the stone crabs that we were catching as the delicacy and they're the delicacy all over the world um, he figured out how to cook them just perfect, how they'd be just right because they were catching them along with this other type of crab that they were lucrative at, blue crab. And they thought the other ones were just trash. Well, they turned out to be one of the most lucrative crab items, you know, seafood items in South Florida that are, you know, or around the world. And he pioneered that. So, you know, I tip my hat to this man for that reason. But we're talking about these earlier generations and cutting off the government, cutting off their way of life. And they said, okay, fuck you, assholes, watch this. Well, they had these opportunity to start, you know, bringing weed into the country because it was the Cubans and the, and the, and the um, Colombians kind of trying to do it. But the different the, uh, thing about these two groups of people is that they don't work very well together. You know, they just didn't kill one another, you know, they don't work together. So it wasn't uncommon for them to stick a gringo like me, a white guy in the middle to to make the deals and shit. So ultimately that's what always wound up happening. But um, when uh, Totch finally made it down to Panama in the, in the earlier years, in the 60s, early 60s, and then around the corner and into Colombia and up the rivers to find the uh, Colombian redbud that everybody was wanting in those days and who was growing it and where they were growing it and how to, how to harvest it, how to cure it you know i mean just the whole system and package and bring it and get it here to the fucking united states it was trial and error and it wasn't an easy thing for this guy to figure out you know and people understand the history of you know the progression and the history of cannabis anywhere in the world it didn't just you know it, it happened by guys like this that you just don't pick the shit put it in a bag and take it somewhere it has to be handled properly it has to be dried properly it has to be you know it have to have cure time just like tobacco has to has to be cured before you can take you know take partake of it but he figured all this shit out you know let's skip and forward and and he started blazing that trail but working with the uh, Cubans in Miami and bringing it around through the uh, uh, the windward and the Mona passes through the Caribbean there's the windward and the Mona pass and the uh, the um, Yucatan pass the only three ways you can get in out of the Caribbean and into Atlantic or Gulf waters <clears throat> so they were using the Mona Pass and the Windward Pass, which is in the eastern side of the Caribbean, or the or, um, eastern side of Cuba, rather, that begins the, um, you know, the, the archipelago of the islands. And um, they're bringing it into Miami. 
you know, and uh, all of a sudden I start having a little bit of difficulty because all of a sudden this, these two corridors are taken up by these assholes that are now, cocaine's becoming a big thing now in the early 70s. You know, this is when George Young, if everybody's heard of him, you know, uh, George Young was a, a pretty prolific cocaine smuggler. He worked with, uh, his partner was, um, was that, Blue? that was Blow. Yeah. And he yeah. was a, a real dude, you know. Um, was I, he proper? Uh, yeah. Good guy. You know, just <laughs> regular, regular old, you know, just like everybody else, you know, let's make some fucking money, man, because we have a way to do this, you know, and figure out a way. And he was a pioneer in his own right, you know, and he. <laughs> smuggled a little bit of weed to start off with, but then wound up working with his partner in the movie, Diego, was actually Carlos Slater, who Pablo Escobar grew up with as a kid in, in, in the gangs in Medellin. <laughs> Excuse me, when a woman by the name of Griselda Blanco, the godmother of cocaine, most people don't know this story or, or know this part about this cocaine history, is that Griselda Blanco was the first one to start importing and create the, the cocaine traffic um, um, routes into the United States way before Pablo even showed up. He was still a young kid in the gangs. He was stealing tombstones and polishing off the names on them and reselling the stones so they could be carved again. You know, that's how he and Carlos were making their, and Slater, Carlos Slater were making their money. <coughs> Excuse me. So Griselda, she already has these routes in place. She pulls car, uh, Escobar and Carlos Slater out of the gangs and teaches them how to gather the coca paste, create the cocaine hydrochloride, and set them up to be her conduit between Colombia and the United States. She gave Pablo Escobar his very first roots of smuggling into the United States. That's who she fucking is. And when she got to Miami, she turned Miami into what you, uh, one of the most popular magazines here in the States, Time Magazine had a big headline, a big front page, Paradise Lost, and they were talking about Miami. She turned Miami into, uh, barring any other conflict of war or theater of war on the planet, Miami was one of the most dangerous places in the world to be at that time because it was a killing ground. Everybody wanted to be the big guy in the cocaine business, right? You know, So you got all these Colombian dudes, all these uh, Cuban guys wanting to be, a, you know, that, be the guy. And she had the coke. She was, you know, I mean, she had the connection. She was it. She was the fucking godmother. And if you want a cocaine, you go through her. Now, the thing about her was, and this is how Escobar became the killer, killing, murderous, infamous son of a bitch he became, was the simple fact that if you got coke from her, whatever, 10, 15, 20, 50 kilos or whatever like that, and you did business with her and you, and you paid her and like that and she didn't like you, she'd kill you. If you did business with her and you fucked her, she'd kill you. If she just didn't like you, she it was she'd kill people like she was ordering a fucking pizza. And consequently, that sort of thing rubbed off onto the everybody else around her started taking that posture. And now um the uh the city of Miami and uh, Fort Lauderdale, they're they're Dayton and, and um um the other county, uh, Broward County Metropolitan Police now are outgunned because there's there's, you know, I mean, it's like eight, 10 to one now, you know, between the Cubans and the Colombians and everybody else in the, in the police force. And now they're using automatic weapons. They're using AK 47s. They're using, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Kalashnikov, the AK 47s and shit, automatic weapons and stuff. And with armor piercing rounds and, and the cops are running around with 38s and shit, you know, so what the fuck? So, I mean, there's no way to beat these guys and what kicked it off over there, what kicked off the, the beginning of the downfall of everything, you know, uh, and including them taking a focus on us was a simple fact that there was what was called the Dade land mall massacre. And it was a couple of Cuban guys looking to gun down a, to other Colombian guys. So they were following them around. They followed them to this mall, shopping mall, and they went into a Crown crown liquor store. And when they got into the store, these two Cuban guys went in there with their automatic weapons and just started firing away at everybody in the store <laughs> to make sure they get the right two guys. So they just killed everybody, you know, and this was a new, this was new to them, you know, because the mob didn't work that way. The mob never killed civilians and killed and women and children and anybody and everybody. They were they were they went directly at whoever the fuck it was they needed to kill. Kill that motherfucker and walk away. Not these fuckers. It was a whole new ball game. They were and when they killed everybody in the store, they ran out of the store shooting at everybody in the parking lot at the same time and drove off. And that's when the 
two Brow the, the two counties, Dade and Broward County, Miami and Fort Lauderdale, called in you know the United States government and said, hey, "You got to help us, man." <laughs> you know that you know they, they're we're overpowered, we're overwhelmed. We need the government's help to interdict you know interdict mm -hmm. because we know now they're they're having to buy automatic weapons themselves to defend themselves against you know machine guns and shit that you know these people are using. But what wound up happening was, of course, they took care of that. So, but um, those routes were having becoming popular, and so Koch Brown turns around and goes, "Look, once that in the early '70s when the cocaine routes started coming through there, and they're now they're getting more attention. They're paying attention to those two passes." <laughs> he says, "Look." Bring it around over here through the Yucatan Pass between the the uh, west or the eastern edge of the Yucatan and the western tip of Cuba. Bring it into the Gulf. And bring it over to where I'm at in the Everglades. And the, you know, and all these islands, ten thousand islands. You get it in there, they'll never find it. You know. So we switched the routes. He switched the routes from coming in through Miami to bringing it around to Southwest Florida. How long does it take? To come from Columbia to get into Southwest Florida, you know, barring any other weather, you know, patterns or, you know, things like that, um, um, or any storm events, eight days, probably. It's an eight-day voyage. How many boats travel those rivers? A lot, a lot. That's why it was, you know, that, and, and you know, that's good that you say that because that's one advantage that we had with regards to bringing larger vessels and getting them, you know, through these areas unseen is a lot of times, you know, the area is so distant between Cuba and the Yucatan that it just, it, it, you know, they just didn't patrol like that, like you would think they would. Not in those days. They were very far and few between. You know, they didn't even have the AWACS with the with the radar and the and the airplane. You know, working. You know, yet in the early eighties, um, they had covered what they thought they needed to have covered, but they had no fucking clue to the extent to which you know all this shit was going on. You can't stop every boat. You know, you just can't. It's impossible to do that. And you you know because there's so much traffic coming through the Caribbean from certain ports of call. If you're coming from Central America, South America, or somewhere in the you know around Jamaica or within that uh, that group of islands like there, you know the U.S. Virgin Islands or what have you, there are what's called the shipping lanes. Larger vessels get into these certain configurated shipping lanes, and that's where they stay. So <laughs> not everybody's not out there all doing this shit. You know, yeah. just crossing the fucking ocean at a, you know, at will. If you're going from one port to another, there's this pr proper way to go that way. So we always kept our vessels within those shipping lanes because if you travel, you know, with a larger vessel outside those lanes of traffic, if it's being viewed by radar, and that's all they had in those days, they didn't have any satellites or any of that bullshit. They could, uh, you know, maybe pick, you know, pick on one that travels outside the shipping lane and become suspect. Ah, let's go check this out. You know, arbitrarily kind of a thing. But that really happened. You know, the shipping lane coming up went through the through that Yucatan Pass, went to Houston, went to New Orleans, and went to Tampa. That was the three main shipping routes like that. You so it was only three? So see, when you're just, When you're talking about, yeah. you know, cargo, I mean... But see, when you're just starting this, you're not starting with an ounce of weed and try to cut up bits and sell... $10 bits, $20 bits, you're going straight to the source? Oh, yeah, man. No, no, yeah. We're going down there and, um, you know, and, and as I was taught, like I, um, I, I told you earlier, I was what was considered as a third generation pot hauler, meaning that the, the guys and the gals that I grew up with as kids, we all learned from their fathers, uncles, and older cousins and this, that next generation, and they learned from the generation in turn before them so the story that i impart through the telling of this history of cannabis and caribbean cannabis in north america spans uh, you know over 40 years in three generations so it started with a gentleman i told you about Totch. well when Totch got it figured out and started making these roots and brought it and started become you know bringing it in got you know telling bring it over here to the everglades that's when he recruit that's when he started recruiting and he recruited five brothers, the Daniels brothers. And I talk about them in the book as well. I grew up with their kids, you know, which were the third generation. So since their father, the youngest of the five brothers, became, be, um, befriended Totch Brown. And Totch taught him how to pothole, you know, how to make money with these Cuban fellas. But, you know, and at that time, it was such an earlier, early part of the, the process where people would say, you know, they, you know, with the, don't work with these people, man. They just soon kill you, then pay you, you know? And Craig's like, you know, the youngest of the brother, he's like, well, nothing could be further from the truth, you know, because he shows up one day with a suitcase full of money, 
opens it up and throws it on the kitchen table. And his brothers are like, what the fuck? You know, he's looking at, you know, he's probably got, I don't know, probably three, 400 grand in the suitcase. And his brother, the brothers start freaking out. You know, they wanted to, you know, disown him. You know, that's how pissed off they got at him, you know. And he, he finally, he, he said, look, just, you know, take some, get your kids some bicycles or something, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's good money. It's free money. I mean, it's whatever. And you know, like that. Well, it didn't take long. One by one, they started coming to him and, you know, they were catching on, they got a job and they all learned a pot hall. They all learned what, you know, we touch and they created the, you know, the mechanism by which we use to, to haul pot. And by, and when I say mechanism, the, um, um, the steps it takes to get it from Columbia to putting it on the buyer's doorstep in Miami, and that's the story. That's the what I'll impart to you now. When I get pat, when I get into my generation now, um, what are the steps? The um, what what actually takes place is, um, you know, it's people have to understand too that when you go to Columbia to get loaded, and even in those days, it wasn't just pull up there, get loaded, and pull out of there. You know, like everybody was on board with it. You know, they had the Navy and their military to deal with too. But the only difference between them and ours is you could pay theirs. You know, <laughs> if it became a real issue, you could just pay these fuckers, right? But then you got to really move your shit because if you've got all your, I mean, I'm talking about you know hundreds of thousands of pounds of bales of wheat, you know, that are that are just there for the purchasing, you know, and we have, and our connection, my connection was was generational as well as we were generational. That means when Tots made that connection, he handed it down to the other, to the five brothers. They in turn handed it down, you know, to, you know, some different people. And then when I finally took over, I went to a couple of people I won't name. And well, and because you know, I had to figure out, you know, their end of it. Who do you go with? Who do you buy? Who, you know, who, you know, who do you talk to? How much do you pay? How, you know, how much do you charge? And all this kind of shit that I, I could tell you how to get it in here. You send a boat to Columbia. It's already been pre-bought. It's already been pre-weighed and loaded and, you know, get ready to be loaded. And we would, you know, either we'd use their boats or we would use our boat to, 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 uh, to haul it from wherever country they wanted it from. We had a connection, a family connection. Now, it was $145 a pound if we used your, if you used your vessel to go get it, bring it to within territorial limits of the United States, which is 30 miles in the Gulf. We'll go out and get it from you and bring it in and put it on your doorstep in Miami for you. For one hundred and forty-five dollars a pound, for however many pounds it is, and if you want us to go get it to where from wherever with our vessels and do the whole thing, which they mostly opted for, just do the whole fucking thing. One hundred and seventy-five dollars a pound. I'll get you whatever you want from wherever you want it and however much you want, because in those days I was buying it for ten dollars a pound. Yeah, why is that so cheap? Because it was just what they were buying. That was just what the so cost 20, was. Thirty dollars a kilo at the, at the source. Ten twenty uh, twenty thirty dollars a kilo. Yeah, it was ridiculous. How much were you selling it for back home? Well, I wasn't selling it. What we were were uh, the it, our our benevolent government described us as service providers. You know, because we never wanted to fuck with it. We never want to sell it. Never. Wanted, I'm bullshit with all that. You now you're involving too many damn people. You know, well, we already got a half a town involved in it. There's 400 people in the little town I'm from. Half the fucking town was involved in doing this for you know all this time, for all these years, and nobody had a fucking clue. You know, but barring that, you take it a step further and break those bonds, those family bonds, and get outsiders involved. And now you're asking for fucking trouble. That's when your shit starts breaking down. You know, that's where you, you know, you get into some real trouble and some assholes. So we never want to own it. We never want to sell it. None of that shit. We'll bring it in. We'll give it to you. You pay us and we'll, you know, you can deal with the fucking the rest of it. <clears throat> so for $175 a pound, I go to Columbia. I buy it for $10 a pound. If I bought 30,000 pounds of Colombian marijuana for you, 15 tons. I would pay right around three hundred thousand dollars for it, and by the time it reaches United States territorial waters, it is now worth between five hundred and seven hundred and fifty dollars U.S. a pound. So I can literally take somebody's three hundred thousand fucking dollars, take it to Colombia, and buy thirty thousand pounds of Colombian marijuana, and by the time it gets to the United States, it's worth fifteen million U.S. dollars. Minus five million, which is what it typically costs for a load that size for my crew and I to work it. 
you just made $10 million in eight days off of $300,000, and you think these fuckers are shooting at me? <laughs> Dude, they can't, they can't give me money fast enough to go back, you know? And people often want, they often query me about, you know, the you know the level of violence that takes place and you know and those sort of things weren't you scared weren't you afraid of, you know fucking with these people and i'm like no because what you don't understand is and in, in, which is the most common misconception all around the world when this topic comes up is the simple fact that that you know it, violence rules the day but it doesn't money rules the fucking day if i can take three hundred thousand miserable dollars that's for three of my buddies and I, that's a weekend in Miami of pissing away money. You know, Boo, who gives a fuck? But uh, to some cocaine cowboy who has the same mindset as we do with mo about money, that's a weekend, of, you know, a party and shit. That's nothing. So you take $300,000 and you turn it into $10 million for this fucking guy. He's not coming after me. He can't. He, he wants me. He wants more, you know. So what happens is if you take that math and you take that 300,000 and you divide it back into 9,700,000, not only have they recouped their 300,000, but they made 10 million. So they made actually 10, three back. They got their original three back. But if you take that three, let's say, let's just take that out of the picture, the original $300,000 and you divide it back into 9,700,000, which makes 10 million together, you come up with the number 32. And what that number represents is the number of chances I have to get your next load to you before you lose money. I can literally lose the next 31 loads. They can be nabbed. They can be grabbed. They can, we would have to throw it. It doesn't matter, whatever the circumstances. I can do that 31 times. As long as I get that 32nd load in to you, you still made money. You haven't lost money yet. That's the ridiculousness of the numbers that we're talking about. So that being said, I've never lost a load. And I've never known anybody that we've ever grew up with to have to lose a load. Now, understand that we weren't the only pot haulers ever working. I mean, there were guys, you know, buying loads and running loads and doing shit, doing their own thing. What I'm talking about is a little town that was able to integrate it into a way of life spanning 40 years and three generations and nobody had a fucking clue. That's all I'm trying to say. You know, I'm not trying to outdo, I'm not dick measuring, not, none of that is because that's all ridiculous. You know, it's all relative, you know. God bless the guy that got one fucking load in, you know, and get you up. Know, I'm sorry about the poor bastard that didn't, didn't get his load in, you know, but there were other pot haulers out there. I'm never going to say that. I'll never take that away from anybody. That would just be insulting. What age did you, what age would, did you get your first load? I was, tw I just turned 21. And what, <clears throat> how much was that? How? <clears throat> that was, that was 15 tons. That was 30,000 pounds. And <clears throat> glad you swung that direction, man, because, you know, um, what wound up happening was, um, you know, like I said, I, you know, when I was doing my high school years and grew up in Wisconsin, my next door neighbor was my best friend and his sister, you know, married a guy from down here <clears throat> and he and her wound up running the only fish house that sold the stone crabs and sold the bait to the fishermen and everything on that little island. They were the, they were the managers of it. They were operating it. <clears throat> so I had just come back from, uh, from LA. I was living out there for a couple of, for a couple of years, um, right out of high school. And um, he calls me up one day and he says, dude, I'm moving to Florida tomorrow. I said, I'm going to go work on a fishing boat. He said, you want to go? I said, and it, 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 this is that mode I was telling you about earlier. Hell yeah, I'm going. Fuck yeah, I'm in, dude. So I packed all my shit into my Cobra, my Mustang Cobra, and took off the next day with him because it sounded like a cool thing to do. you know. So I grabbed the opportunity like I had always told myself. And... Um, we drove for two days and wound up at the end of this little highway and right on the end, it, 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 uh, that highway dead ended on that little tiny island, you know, and her sister was just, in, and brother-in-law were just building a new home at the time. So I didn't have a job working on a boat, but I had a job working with their carpenters and their masons, you know, helping them build that home until I could get a job, you know, otherwise working. But so I had, you know, something to do when I got there. Well, the captain of the boat that my buddy went to go work on, um, there's two people, three people working the boat, the captain, there's, and there's two people on the stern of the vessel that are one that are pulling the traps by hydraulics. And, um, do they, sh do they have a show in, in Scotland called, um, Deadliest Catch? Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. Okay. Fisherman. Yeah. In, in Alaska. Yeah. Now it, 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 
I don't want to by in no means compare it to you know how dangerous that shit is. I mean, I'm fuckers. I wouldn't do that shit. Okay, that, and I'm a fisherman. I wouldn't fuck that. I wouldn't bug with that shit. But the mechanics of it are the same. They throw a grappling hook to grab a rope between two buoys and pull a thousand pound trap. We have a, hook, a a pole with a hook on the end of it, which is typically a shark's hook that I've ground the barb off of and and fiberglassed it to the end of it. So we can just grab our buoys and the rope, pull the rope up and through. And that thing that's spinning that they always put the rope in, that's called a shiv. And what that does is it, it's almost like two pie plans, pie plates together like this. And it grabs the rope in the center and it cinches and grabs hold of it and it pulls the rope. And there's another little piece down below between those pieces that kicks the rope back out. So theirs goes into a coiler. Ours just coil at our feet because we've only got eight at the longest 80 foot lines or, you know, I don't know how, what that is in you guys in meters or shit. I don't understand that shit. But um, anyway, so um, it's very similar. So um, and they're only pulling maybe 40 traps a day if they're lucky. We're pulling 600 a day. I pull one. And then the boat moves up to the next buoy, and I'm clearing it, taking the crabs that are good, taking the crabs that are bad out of it, and leave, and rebaiting it and cleaning it up and getting it ready to close back up and to throw back in the water. So when the, my buddy on the other side grabs his buoy and pulls his trap, I push mine back into the water. So every time you pick one up, you're dropping one. Pick one up and drop one. You go 300 traps one direction, skip over about 80 yards and um, maybe uh, 20 meters or so, and had, and pulse 300 back the other direction because you don't want to be twice as far away from home as you when you started. And there's those first runs, those both those runs are usually about 20 miles or so. You got 300 traps spread out over 20 miles in length. And um that's a good day's work. And we had 6,000 of these fucking stone crab traps and we're to only 600 a day in these different areas that we're pulling. And we do that by day. And these boats are very perfectly suited for carrying these, you know, rectangular traps that weigh about 50, 60 pounds a piece because the bottom six inches of the trap itself is full of concrete. So when you throw it off the back of the boat, you just push it like that. It's going to land on that concrete bottom. It's not going to land upside down or anything like that. It's going to fucking land on that bottom like that. So we, we make them heavy. <clears throat> Plus, if any seas come up, the buoys can't drag the pots. You know, like this. They call them pots there. We call them crab traps here. But that's the process by which that is done. Now, these boats are perfectly designed to move those traps, but they're also perfectly designed to stack bales of weed on because they're rectangular and they're 80 pounds, you know, and they work perfectly. So we would do the stone crabbing by day and, you know, work by night. But my first day working on this boat, <clears throat> we finished building the, the home. Excuse me. We finished building the home, and Captain Billy, who's running the boat that my buddy's working on, he's itching to get back into the working, you know, because everybody else pot pot hauling season's coming up, and everybody's starting to work, you know. So and, when you say season, what do you mean? Is uh, yeah. season is the <laughs> harvest? <laughs> what, 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 is, what is, is harvest <laughs> season in South America, mm -hmm. which is our winter, mm -hmm. um, coming into our um, coming so, into our winter or coming into our summer, is going into their fall, which is their harvest season. So that's when everybody starts to really work. That's when the shit really starts to come, you know. So he wanted to get back into it, but he didn't trust one of the other guys on the boat. He knew my buddy, Mark, where he came from. He's brothers, he's, you know, brothers with this guy that owns the fish house, and he was a local. So there was no, well, he might be a cop or, you know, some shit like that. Well, this other guy that was working, he's from Michigan or some shit. They don't really know him, so Captain Billy wanted to get rid of him, and it only took about a, a week to work this guy to death, and he quit. <laughs> because, I mean, stone crabbing and pulling traps and doing that kind of work, I mean, it'll make a fucking man out of you in a hurry. If, I mean, most guys, and I was told by one of the older uh, older fishermen down there at one time, he said, you might last, you might do it one, maybe two seasons, and you'll that'll be enough. You'll, you'll have a credit. I said, why? He said, because it'll break you. I mean, it's it's hard work. And they go over, they're turning over people all the time. So they got this guy off the boat and they got me on because they knew where I was from. So what wound up happening was they imparted how it works. You get up early in the morning at first dawn, you know, you get on at like three in the morning and it takes a little couple hours or so to get to where you're going to start working. And you start pulling that first trap when the, it's just light enough out to see. And you start working because you got a lot of fucking work to do. 
Well, they imparted the scenario to me and I get on a boat and then I get in my bunk, which is in the wheelhouse with the captain. Both of our bunks are, you know, right behind the captain. And um, I wake up and the sun's up and the boat's just sitting still. And I'm thinking, well, they told me we were supposed to start at dawn. And I leaned over and I looked out of the bunk like this and there's Captain Billy sitting in his chair like this with a big fucking grin on his face. He says, Timmy, we're not going to pull traps today. He says, brother, we're going to hang out here all day and fuck off and go unload a pot boat from Columbia later tonight. <laughs> it just kind of pulled it on me, man. I didn't know what the fuck was, you know, that was just Shanghai me and get me offshore, one of those kind of things. And I said, cool, man, let's go for it, you know. But it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek affair for him and my buddy, they knew what was going on, so they thought they just wanted to spring it on me when I got out there. So my first day going to work on this fishing boat, I did, I never saw one trap. We hung out there offshore, you know, fucked around, smoked weed, you know, swimming around a boat and shit. And at about maybe three, four hours before sundown, um, we'd be at a particular spot, and Captain Billy would call, would have a, a call sign. Every boat that we ever, excuse me, let me uh, turn this. Um, every boat that we would ever unload or approach to unload was always given to us by way of a particular, um, <coughs> particular call sign. You give out this call sign, and then when you hear a repeat back, somebody answering that, that boat now knows that the one coming to it is the one that should be. Don't freak out, because that's us coming. We would always stay off on what's called the horizon on the water. The horizon is where... You know, if you've ever driven anywhere flat land or you've gone offshore in a boat and, and you see everything shrinking in the distance like this, and when it disappears, that's your horizon. That's where, the, that's where you meet the curvature of the earth and everything goes out of vision. It goes out of your vision. We stay on that horizon. So we, we're not visible to that boat. That boat's not visible to us. So if anything should happen to that fucker while we're out there, we're like, what boat are you talking about? Oh, that one on the radar that's way over here? You know, so we, we dismiss ourselves. But when it comes time to unload, call sign, and we have 10 miles is usually about what the horizon amounts to. We have 10 miles, and, and by the time we're making that run, that crew should be bringing the material out, the, the, the bales of pot. Now, these are 80-pound rectangular bales of marijuana that so weigh about 80 Are you meeting each. someone on the lakes, on the waters, to then yes. swap shipment? There was always, uh, that was the second part of the scenario. The first part of the scenario is the boat going to whatever country, Jamaica, South America, Central America, Belize, you know, wherever, and getting the material and bringing it to within territorial limits of our of our. Um, international waters they won't come in any further because they can stay in international waters because a lot of the boats we used weren't weren't american registered a united states vessel can't stop can only stop a united states registered vessel coast guard has to get permission from the country of origin in order to board or seize or whatever the, that vessel so it's a progress that at that time they didn't want to fuck with so if you were in the Indian Ocean and you had an American registered vessel and the, and the United States Navy or Coast Guard was over there, they could literally stop you for no reason and board you. They can't any other boat, only, you know, registered vessel. Like but anyways, that's the first part of it, going down, getting that fucking load, which is 15 tons, let's say, that was this time, and bring it to there. And then we would have coordinates to go already designated to meet this boat at certain latitude and longitude and those days we were using um there was no gps we were using what's called a low ran and that's an acronym for a long range aid to navigation and what it did would triangulate three different signals coming from three different areas and wherever you were amongst that triangular spot and it was really very accurate you know for the for the day i mean it would put me within 3 feet of my fishing spots or my dive spots that i would be on you know but you know like that so we would know where the boat was how to find it and like that so we'd call it let it know us were coming and they would start bringing the material up so when we had, when we got there they would have some material to give to us otherwise we would get off of our boat get onto the mothership help that crew go down below and put all the load on deck help them do that because there's only a couple of guys on the boat dude and we got from the time the sun goes down to the time the sun comes up to get this shit back to the island and get it off our boat and get the fuck out of there 
You know, we only have so much time to work with, so we got to help these guys. There's no going out there, hey, dude, how you doing? You know, all this kind of shit. No, it's it's everybody knows what the fuck to do. Get up there, go down in the hole, stand next to that guy, and start throwing fucking bales. You know, and then they start throwing them down on our boat. We stack them, and we're down there stacking, and they're throwing. We're stacking, and we get them on the bow. We get them on the sides. We get them on the roof of the wheelhouse. We put them everywhere and fucking where we can stick these damn things, and then we get out of there. We pull it in. We, we come in shore, and we come in just outside the islands where we live, the 10,000 islands, because now our boat's too heavy to draft through that. What are you thinking, your first shipment? Boat full of weed your very first time. Were you nervous? Oh, dude, yeah. Well, no, not really. Because, you know, I mean, uh, it, you know, and that's that's a great question because, I, you know, throughout the whole time I did this, I was never nervous and never scared of it. For I don't even, can't even remember why. I think it's because you were high as a motherfucker. Well, boat. yeah, a lot of times we were, you know, because that was part of our job was to check the shit as it was coming in because if it was good, we're like, grab some of this shit, man. You're going to like this. Were you not tripping balls? Huh? Were you not tripping balls when you're high? paranoid no fuck no no <laughs> man no it was like you know once we load the boat and we've got probably a couple of hours of riding to get or three you know two three hours to ride because we start you know two three hours before the sun's down and a lot of times we're away from that boat before the sun even goes down so we've got two three four hours sometimes of just captain doing his work looking at the radar and he's you know watching to making sure that's his job we did ours now it's his turn we're just in the back hanging out and fucking rolling fucking giant spliffs and fucking just checking the bales, you know, checking this shit out, right? So we could tell the guys when we get it into shore that, yeah, you got to get some of this shit, you know, or, or don't even bother, you know, don't worry about it, you know, get, try the next shit, you know, like that. But we get into shore, the smaller boats, say like 20, 30 of them that could draft through the shallows. And a lot of them had twin engine, 235 horsepower Evan roots on them because you could put 40 bales of weed on this thing and it would fly through the water. It had vertical, say this is your prop. It had vertical and horizontal trim, meaning you could trim the motor out like they typically do, <laughs> but you could also bring the motor up. So the prop comes up to the bottom of the boat. As long as the prop will go through the water, the fucking boat will go through the water. So they're taking these boats through water this deep nobody's following them anybody following them that's out of their mind because they're going to be stuck in the mud you know back behind us we had this shit figured out man so they would come out like flies on a garbage can and start taking and two guys on each boat one guy driving and another mate and he jumps on our boat and they start and there's bales going off and those boats are just stuck in there like this at us and they're just taking and taking and running and taking and running it through the islands to the island we live on chuckalusky and i'll give you a picture we'll put up a picture of the island and Typically, from that point, we've got anybody that had a house that was on the edge of the island that had a dock, we were using it. And what I mean by using it would be if I've had, you know, depending on the size of the load, and these are small loads, it's 30,000 pounds is a small load. We take the, all the furniture out of one of my buddy's houses, and, and then that night we would stuff it full of this shit. So when the sun comes up, it's all in that house. And then the next day, when the sun comes up, like seven in the morning, you know, everybody's getting, getting up and going fishing or doing what they're doing and shit like this. We've got cars and trucks and vans and anything that will hold, you know, bales of pot driving out to this house, you know, because everybody's got what's called a two meter radio, five digit combination on the radio. We could set it to whatever frequency it was unscannable in those days. And I had like 200 of them or our crew had like 200 of them. So all the bail handlers, all the boats, everybody had one. So communication was key, you know, so because if something happened, Hey, you know, everybody would know about it, you know, but so, I mean, we stuffed these houses full. And a lot of times when the houses were loading the houses that night, some of the owners of the vehicles that were being loaded would drive it out there that night, load it while we're loading the house and drive it back into town and park it in his own front yard full of fucking weed. And nobody knows that this van is, I mean, this van's got like 40 bales of fucking pot in it because <laughs> it was sitting in his front yard. Who in the right mind would do something like that? You know, this is hide in plain sight shit. This is what we were masters of. So and a lot of cars got loaded that way. But during the day, the next day, I mean, we got 30,000 pounds of shit that's got to go out, got to get out of here. So that's when the shore crew takes over. And that's when a lot of the women get involved in driving. So who's going to stop some chick going down the road in a fucking van or in a car or in a, you know, in a truck, a pickup truck, drive to Miami. And we, we take it from Everglades, drive it to Miami. And the drivers never own the vehicles. The drivers have never seen the vehicles get loaded. The, the, the owners do that. 
That way, if anything happened to the driver, he couldn't tell them where the shit came from. I don't know. I just picked the van up and drove it away. I don't know where the fuck this shit's at, right? You know? And, you know, at any one time, there could be, you know, 30, 40 drivers. I mean, driving this shit off the island. Because when we got going, man, there were days when there were day after day after day, we were moving 40 tons a day. 80,000 American pounds of fucking shit a day off that island. And no, who would ever suspect a town of 400 people that some shit like this was going on? So we did that first job that night, and that's how it worked. The guys would drive it to Miami, and while these drivers are doing this, you know, there's some coming back and some passing going the other way because there were so many of them. And we take it to a plaza in East Miami, or West Miami somewhere, along Chrome Avenue and Kendall, which means nothing to you and your viewers most likely. But anyways, um, to a plaza or a strip mall, they would pull in and park their vehicle and get out and go window shop. And we would have one of our guys working with the people that owned the shit because we never owned a shit. That's our truck. That's our van. That's our car. That's our, you know, whatever, you know, and we pointed to them. Our guys would get out of them. They'd put their people in them and then drive them away and go empty them and bring them back. We developed what the um, U.S. government now describes as dead drop. Dead drop meaning you get out, you drop the vehicle and get away from it. You just dead drop it. Somebody else takes it. So that way, nobody in Miami ever knew where it came from in Everglades. Nobody in Everglades ever knew where it went to in Miami. So there was a break in the in the in in the in the um, machine there, which was a buffer of safety built in. Now the drivers had their own way out too. It, at any one time, there's ten, fifteen, and depending on how much we're moving, twenty spotter drivers that are getting paid five thousand dollars a day to run from Everglades to this plaza back and forth in staggered positions and that's all they get paid to do all day long is make that run back and forth and the reason is because if any one of our drivers happens to get stopped by marine patrol national park ranger highway patrol um um, um feder- uh, florida fish and what game and wildlife which are you know one of the most powerful agencies in florida i mean there's a lot of them out there but they're in that area they're very few and far between and what we would do a lot of times when I took over was I would have people sitting outside these people's homes <laughs> or following wherever they may be. So we got an eye on them because, I mean, between Everglades and Naples, there may be two highway patrol troopers tro- that whole fucking road. Only two. That's 120 fucking miles of road. And you got two cops out there, you know, watching the whole thing. They're not going to go. They're not, catch- they're not catching anything. But if they do... Our drivers get stopped. They're trained to just wait till whoever stops you gets between your vehicle and theirs, throw yours in reverse, and now it weighs a, a ton, you know, 2,000 pounds more or better than what it did when it was empty. And you ran the shit out of that guy's car in his radiator. He ain't going fucking nowhere. And you just take off and drive and take off. Well, you're not going to outrun the radio. He ain't going anywhere, but he's on the radio. Let you call for help. Well, that's 45 minutes away if he does call for the fucking help in the first place. So all they got to do is get out of sight of him, stop in the middle of the highway, leave the goddamn thing sitting there and park running or whatever, and get out of it, and one of the spotters will be right there waiting for him to get him picked up. Now, he doesn't own the vehicle. He's just the driver. By this time, the owner now knows that he's been stopped, and he's on the phone calling the cops going, dude, I just looked out my driveway. My fucking car's gone, man, or my truck's gone, or my van's gone. I think somebody stole my shit. He reports it's stolen, and it relieves him of any responsibility for whatever that thing may have been involved in, and he get it back. <laughs> Boink. Boats are the same way. Captain Billy never owned that fucking boat. His daddy did. So we had our own escape. We have a chase boat, it's called. So he's yeah. had backups at every angle? Oh, yeah. We had it backed up. I mean, I mean, we had it out. I How mean, much did you make your first shipment? Uh, that first time, that first night, was uh, I got rookie pay. Yeah, because they were trying this thing, out, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I got paid five thousand dollars. And is that when but, you realized there's money to be made? Well, I, well, not until the next night. <laughs> Same again, dude. Yeah, I, I get on the boat like I'm gonna go fishing again. You know, here I go. You know, twenty one year old me, dumbass. Where I'm going? You know, gonna pull traps today. No, I wake up and fuck the sun's up again. <laughs> I look out of the bunk like this, and Billy goes, we're going to get 22 tons tonight, Timmy. <laughs> That's 44,000 U.S. pounds. 
22 tons. He says, we're going for 22 tonight. So my first two days working on this boat, so you're talking, I never saw a fucking crab trap, dude. You're talking 20,000 kilos? Yeah, however, whatever that comes to, yeah. I think that's 2.2. 20,000, 2.2 pounds in a kilo. A kilo yeah. So you're, so you're so shifting. 40 pounds, 40,000 pounds. That's, that's, that's 20, that's 20 something thousand kilos. About, yeah. So you're shipping 20,000 kilos a night? Yeah. Fuck yeah. And a lot of times it's not just our boat. It's our boat and, and maybe one or two or three others as big as it just to get the load that we're there to get. I've seen boats with as much as 300,000 pounds on them. That's, what is that? 150 plus kilos? 150,000 kilos? A boat full of shit. And we would take, you know, two, three, four nights to go out back and forth to get, to get the fucker unloaded. How was there such this, a high demand? This was how it was, man. This is just, we and were- how, And how many punters did you have, like people to buy? How many? Well, see, that was, the, that was the beautiful thing about our end of it. We didn't care about any of that shit. You just had to get it to No, them. the way it worked was the other half of the scenario, you know, I told you how it all mechanically works, but, you know, once we get this load to my, you know, we get it brought in, say, for instance, if it was my job and I've done these dozens of times, if you owe me $25 million, which would be my cut for bringing in your load of shit, whether it's, you know, that's something that big might be 80 tons, I mean, or 40 tons. I mean, it's a big load to get that, that, that kind of money. But if you owed me $25 million, I bring your load in. Now your load is worth, who knows what the fuck it's worth, you know? I'll give you all of it except for $25 million worth of it. I'll keep a hold of it. You start paying me, I'll start giving you your shit back. You give me ten million, I give you ten million of your bales that I'm holding. You give me the whole twenty five million, I give you all of your shit back. And the reason I do that is, and they know this up front, when your load comes in, it's gonna be minus what an equivalent of what you owe me. Because if you lose your fucking shit in Miami, I can make one phone call and sell this shit and we're getting fucking paid. We didn't travel all around the fucking Caribbean and, and risk our fucking asses to not get paid. You know, so if you fuck, particularly if you fuck up, that's on you. We're getting paid. And that's just how it worked. That was, that was a given. There was no arguing that point. So that's how it worked as far as, you know, getting it to them and getting paid. And a lot of times, you know, see, you don't just give them their shit and they pay you. The reason why we hold on to our equivalent pay is because we need to wait until that load begins to sell. We get paid out of that load. So it could be a week, two weeks, three weeks before we get fully paid. But by that time, I've probably done four or five more jobs. You know, and there were times when two or three paydays would come in at once. And I'm having to go to Miami to a house we had in Coral Gables was the money house. And, you know, I, some of my paydays were 50 million, you know, 55 million fucking dollars. You know how much time it takes to count 55 fucking million dollars and yeah, hundreds days. in this room, fifties in this room, twenties in this room, tens in this one. And there's an eight car garage out back that's just <laughs> stuffed full of $5 bills because a, a half a, a half a ton of $5 million, 1000 pounds is a, is a half a million dollars in fives a th and it weighs a thousand pounds. That's only half a million. I can't take, if you owe, if you owe me 20 million, I can't take it all in hundreds and fifties. I got to take it each denomination and divide it up. And once you start doing that, now you're weighing, now you're counting thousands of pounds of money because each United States bill, no matter what denomination it is, weighs one gram. There's 28 of those in an ounce and there's 16 of those in a pound. It's just fucking math from that point on. So all you got to do is the guys go into the bedroom where the hundreds are and they load a laundry basket full of them. They bring them out and you start dumping them out onto the scale because you've already pre-weighed what $1 million in these bills with the rubber bands on them weighs. And you dump them in there and you've got a digital industrial digital scale with another basket on it. And as soon as that scale reaches that proper number, that's a million dollars. You, you know, you pour enough tens in there and it's 220, 200, and, I think it's 240 pounds of tens is a million dollars. So you're making millions, living a high life, smuggling weeds. How was life then? 
what were you doing? Were you just saving, oh, spending, was partying? was fucking <laughs> insane, man. <laughs> It was insane. You know, and um, you know, there's a lot of joviality built into the story that I wrote because it's, you know, it's a bunch of kids. You know, it's me as a kid telling you this fucking crazy shit that I just wound up tripping and falling into. I didn't aspire to be any of this. And like I said earlier, there was no dysfunction in my family that drove me to become an outlaw. You know, none of that shit. I just tripped and fell into it. I, I, I smoked weed. What do I give a fuck about unloading a boat full of shit? Yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it, you know? So, and I was never scared of it because us kids, you know, when I say kids, us 20-year-old guys, and it was all the guys in the fleet, 25, 30 boats in this crabbing fleet, and each boat has two crew members on it, and everybody else in town wanting to be a crew, wanting to be a crabber. If you're a stone crabber, I mean, that's like I told you, it'll make a man out of you. You're tight, you're tough. I mean, you can take this shit. So when, you, when it comes to unloading these boats... It's not the fucking adults out there doing this shit. They're sending the kids out there to get up there and fucking go to work, you know? Get in the hole of that motherfucker, and it's just throw bales until you puke, you know? And then you get a drink of water, and you go back down in the hole, and you throw some more, because once you start, you can't stop. There's no fucking stopping. You got to finish the fucking job that you got out there to begin, you know? And when you're a kid and you're averaging like I was 21 years old, I'm averaging 200 fucking thousand dollars US a week. You know, the adults have to step in at some point and, and make you understand as a kid, you know, that there's ways to spend money and there's ways that to not spend money that draw attention. We're going to show you several, give you several ideas or instances on how to spend money and not have anything to show for it. But beyond that, it's on, it's you, it's on to you. But if you start getting stupid and you start getting fucking crazy and then you're buying houses and you're buying Ferraris or you're buying Porsches or stupid shit like that, you just don't work anymore. You're a liability now. You're no asset. So we were so strict it was. And yeah, it was. It was literally that way because, I mean, we're talking about a town for 40 years that had this, uh, se was a secret nobody fucking knew. And it, because nobody we had, get busted we never talked for 40 about years. It. Well, every now and then, a car would get stuck. A car, or there'd be somebody doing fucking up, or somebody doing something stupid, but nothing really major. And nobody ever know? turned. Nope. Nobody ever fucking snitched, became a rat. N nope. No, not in all those years. No. How many we, people were in, involved? Jesus, 200 or better, just in our town. But there were five other, there were four other crews working. The, you know, there was an island north of us, Goodland. There was Marco Island, which was just north of Goodland Island. There was Naples, which is one of the main big towns in southwest Florida. And then there was Pine Island, which was just north of uh, Fort Myers and around what's called Cape Coral. There was a crew in each of those areas. But they weren't as prolifically working as we were. But until Operation Everglades 1 and Operation Everglades 2, these are federal operations that involved over 250 federal agents from every branch of law enforcement in these United States, CIA, Secret Service, FBI, FDLE, Customs, you name them, they were involved in these operations to try to stop the smuggling. Um, because it was, I mean, they they... They knew it was taking place, but they had no idea to the extent to which it was taking place, you know, because even they didn't believe it when they figured, when they finally figured it out. <laughs> but, um, you know, like we're going these three generations, you know, on three generations of this shit. And they get the first two generations with the first two operations. So it took two. The first Operation Everglades was a flop. All these hundreds of agents showed up and there was like three people in town that they wanted because they knew in those days, the older generations, they had senators and congressmen and judges. They had them all bought and paid for. And, and two weeks before this thing took place, they knew it was happening. So they, was, they weren't around when that day came, right? So I, almost a year to the day, here they came again. <coughs> and this time, the judges and all their buddies that they were paying and shit like this on the inside said, you know, stick around because they ain't going to give up. How much money do you actually think went through there the last 40 years? Oh, my God. Hundreds of millions, billions. Oh yeah, it's got to be in the, it's got to be in the billions. You know, if you're talking about money with regards to the amount in 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 money in 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 material, if you figure the average price of a, you know, the average price of a of a of a pound of marijuana in those days in the early '80s was five hundred dollars a pound. We're talking about between the eight, early 80s and the late 80s, 500, it went to 750. Now, if you can 
get a calculator and do the math, this is the answer to your question. We calculated, I did actually calculate it based on the, the amounts and the loads that I knew, some 30 million pounds of Caribbean marijuana came through Southwest Florida in those years. So you take 30 million times $750 a pound, 30 million times 750. 2.25 billion. If that's what it comes to, that's what it was. Yeah. Just had that off guess there, I think you're straight, but yeah. So it's Some a, it's a, the comments. It's a staggering. Fucking slaughters, yeah. It's a staggering fucking number, you know, but we never thought about it in those types of, in those terms because it was a day to day event for us. It was, uh, you know, it was running from the law. It was dodging. It was doing, it was being, you know, sneaky and shady when you were working, man. It was all about that. And, and the, the, the key thing about it was, like I said, nobody ever talked about it. You know, like if you see your buddies out there offshore and we're unloading boats and we're doing this and we're moving shit around, you know, whatever like this, and you go to the club the next night and you're whooping, you're hooping and hollering, it's never spoken of. It's like it never happened. We were, the, we were ghost people. What's the most you made? The most I ever made in one job... And it wasn't just it wasn't just one night, okay. I'm gonna I get I get paid from when I go to Columbia to buy it. It usually takes about three weeks. In three every, in three weeks, one night's work, three week two two three weeks to set up, one night's work. Most I ever made was about four and a half million in one night. What was your lifestyle like? Uh Pretty low key, really, except for when it came time to go to the clubs and, you know, and, and spend money because right. the clubs were the easiest way to spend a lot of money because, I mean, dude, I was getting paid as a kid, you know, I was getting paid for jobs that I had don't remember having done <laughs> because these paper bags would be just slidden across the kitchen table at me and I might be getting paid for a job I did three weeks ago because, like I said, you don't get paid right away. And next thing you know, here comes these paper bags with, you know, 50,000, 75,000, 100,000, 120,000, you know, slid a table uh, you know, across the table at me. And, you know, it wouldn't be anything for us to, um, me and four of my buddies to take, uh, you know, 200,000 US dollars each for a four day, you know, trip to Miami and start in Miami and wind up in South Beach and each night take the tab on two or three clubs along the way. All night, pay everybody's bar tab for the whole fucking night, you know, and then the next night, and we had a million dollars between us. And in those days, you're talking about drinks, you know, and, in, in, you know, high dollar drinks were like $3. You know, it takes a lot of can. I mean, it's a lot of drinking. These motherfuckers can drink. And it was, you know, you'd have to take three clubs in order to spend that kind of money because it was just the sole intention was to take a million dollars over there between five of us. And at the end of the at the end of the fourth day, have just enough money for gas to get home. That was the whole idea of the trip was just piss the fucking money away, you know, or buy somebody a car that really needed it, or just some stupid shit like that. You know, I'd buy boats for people. I bought car. I bought this chase boat. I'll show you a picture of. It. We'll put it up. I spent uh, almost eighty two. I think it was about eighty six thousand dollars. What it what it came to with the electronics, and I know the people at the marina where I bought it. <clears throat> I gave him a hundred thousand, one hundred and ten thousand dollars in cash, and I said, you know, once the boat's paid for, you know, just keep what's left over, just spread it around for everybody. It only cost me eighty five grand. I think they, it was like thirty five thousand left over or some shit like that, right? But they knew at that time because they were friends of mine that, you know, money money laundering here in the United States didn't become illegal until nineteen eighty six. It was. Keeping an eye on your spending versus your income is what they were paying particularly attention to. And if you spent more than $10,000, you're required to fill out what's called a, a CTR, a cash transaction receipt. So these people that are buying all these expensive items from knew that if I gave them cash for this shit, because they knew me, they knew us guys from Everglades, right? They, they knew that, you know, to, um, to take $9,900 Every day, each day, and deposit nine thousand nine hundred dollars, nine thousand nine hundred till it's paid for, and it doesn't. They don't have to report it, and then they keep whatever I got left over as as their commission. <laughs> like that. I get a brand new boat worth eighty eighty five grand, and 
they get paid 35 grand for just, you know, helping me out, you know, and shit like that. It's just, you know, and, and running charters. I, I, I set it up. I became a dive master and I was diving, I was charter diving. I was fishing charters and I was this and that because if you, if it's, um, if charter business is considered a service in Florida, you don't have to pay the state taxes on that shit. So I'm back there or even a federal tax, you don't pay any taxes. It's a service. So I'm out there some nights, I'm sitting at home, I'm writing these charters out. This, this guy paid 700, this guy paid $1,200 for this. You know, and I'm just washing it. The money was, you know, negligible compared to what I was making, but it was spendable cash, you know? And um, I even had, you know, we're talking about counting money. Jesus Christ, counting money. What a pain in the fucking ass that was. We had six federal counting money machines that we got from uh, what's called the Bank of America here in Miami. And these things count like, 70, I don't know, something ridiculous, 70 bills a second or something. It's just stupid. I mean, these things are going. <clears throat> and to count even $20 million, it take a couple of days because you're not doing, you're doing all every denomination, you know, that's a lot of bills and shit. With, with even with money machines, then you got a ledger, you got to write down, you got to ban, unband them, you got to reband them, and you got to, we figured out how to weigh it. Like I said earlier, it was easier just to fucking weigh it. So what was taking me three days was not taking me three hours and then I'm back home. But the, the amount of money that we were getting paid and the, the, and, and what it weighed because money weighs tons. I'm literally talking tons of money. It would often take more time to get the money home than it took to get their shit to them. <laughs> you know, but this is growing up as kids, man. You know, what were you doing with the cash? Anything we fucking wanted to, man. Well, yeah. how were you storing it? Um, you know, and that's that's a great question because there's also a common misconception about burying money. Pot haulers and smugglers burying their money. Well, you don't bury your fucking money. Are you kidding me? It molds. It, molded, it yeah, rots. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, I mean, it's fucking paper. You know, it's yeah. it's not taken care of, and that's why when you go into a bank and you get a stack of one dollar bills or what like that, it has a paper band on it, not a rubber band on it. It's paper. Why? Because if it's not stored at, a, at at the right temperature, which banks are, money is used. Money is designed by its very nature to be circulated and used. And if it's used a lot, like the money we were getting and banded, the, all the bacteria that's on that money starts rotting and eating these band, these band, these rubber bands, and they start falling apart. That's why <laughs> the government uses paper when they ban their fucking money because the germs and all that i mean money's nasty shit man but you know that being said what we couldn't do by way of just pissing money away like one day buying seven brand new jeeps that cost eight thousand nine uh eight thousand seven hundred and eighty five dollars each brand new ragtop jeep wranglers i was buying a, a car that day a corvette that i saw in the parking lot and i called a buddy to come and get my you know drive up with another guy to drive my cobra home because i wasn't selling it and I'm looking out there, and I see they got Jeeps for sale. And I said, get Timmy, Jimmy, get Teddy, get Willie. And we bought, and they all come up in one car, right? We bought seven of these fucking things. And we took them out to this place called Bad Luck Prairie, and we had one hell of a demolition derby, dude, like you, you, like you couldn't imagine. We beat the shit out of these fucking things, man. It was, what a blast. I mean, and, and there's trees and palmettos, and all of a sudden you see a guy darting this way, and you try to head him off this way and side and broadside him and shit, you know. And my girlfriend, that if you uh, please read the book, if you read the book, I mean, it's it's a wild ass tale. It's just, it's not a crazy statistical romp through the war on drugs. This is, this dude sitting there telling you know, all this crazy shit that happened when I was growing up. But my girlfriend was a blonde, typical blonde bartender. She's in the passenger seat, all buckled in this Jeep, right? And she's looking around. She sees the roll bar. And she's thinking, well, it's got a roll bar. You can roll this fucking thing, I think. You know, this is what's going on in her head. And she starts screaming, roll it, roll it, roll it. She's hanging onto the bar in the front, you know, like this. You know, she's screaming, roll it. And then after about a half hour, I'd had enough of that fucking shit. I cranked that wheel like this. <laughs> I rolled that son of a bitch. It must have, I don't know, it must have flipped three fucking times, right, or some shit. It landed on its top. We're upside down, hanging in the straps. And I'm spitting out sand. I got sand in my fucking eyelids and shit. And I look over at her, and she's screaming, and she's crying. She's going, why the fuck did you do that? Why the fuck would you do something like that? And I said, because you fucking told me to, you bitch, and you wouldn't shut up. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we just climbed out of it and got it left. It. We had one Jeep left that was good, you know, in good enough shape to get us back to the dealership. And it, you know, we pull in and this fucking thing's doing this, you know, and we pull it into an empty spot. We all get out and get into our cars and take off and just let the dealer have his fucking Jeep back. <laughs> when does it, when does the greed, the greed kick in? The greed? Yeah. It never did. So why keep going? Well, because, and that's another great question, which very seldom asked of me. We kept going simply because, you know, as kids, we always keyed on the adults. We watched them. If they looked worried, if they, you know, if there was some kind of, if there was shit going on, then we would key off of them. But that was never that way. We were always comfortable with it. If they were okay, we were okay. And I knew this, and we all knew how to do what we were doing so well because we grew up doing it. So when it came time to actually do it ourselves, we knew exactly what we were doing. And not only that, being the generation that we were, we're into the new shit now. You know, we we umped the game. We brought in what's called T-crafts, which are shallow drafting boats that are uh, badass boats of those days. They had twin 235 Evan Roots. Open vessel boat with a with a center console on the stern next to the engine. So the whole bow is wide open. And there were two brothers in town, Morgan brothers. They were building boats to our specifications as well. Designed specifically to do what we needed them to do was go through the shallows carrying as many bales as they could fucking carry. And when you're talking about five crews working, there's 50 to 70 people on each crew. And each crew has probably 25 to 30 of these boats to come out to help unload because you need the smaller boats to bring it in to shore like that. So that's a lot of fucking boats like that. So there's hundreds of them. And some of them are used day to day like this and that and being seen, but unless, but the majority of them are stuck in garages where they're out of sight and can't be seen because if the cops are driving around and they see like every other house has got one of these boats, what you know, I mean, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> you know, that's just like drawing attention to yourself and shit. But it took those kind of boats. What we also did was, uh, by doing away with the old style, they call them mullet boats, what the older generations were using. These were flat boats used for netting fish in shallow water for bait for the crabbers. They could get into the shallows and stuff like that. That's what the older generation were using. Now we upped the game. Now we're using these T-crafts that'll do 70 mile an hour before you ask him and he hits the fucking seat. But you can put 40 bales on this thing and it'll run through, like, it'll run through 11 inches of water, like I told you. But... Along with that, the older generations were also using, you know, whatever mechanic they needed, everybody using their own mechanic or whatever. A guy would use two or three different mechanics. We did away with all of that. All of our boats are now running with Evinrude 235 horsepower Evinrudes on them. That was the engine of the day. That was the most powerful, most dependable engine that there was on the market in those days. And we relied on that. We had one mechanic. He had six guys working with him that one mechanic. If you had something happen to one of your engines, <clears throat> and this was always a big thing of mine, I said, look, if something ever happened to one of your engine and it left you fucking sitting, get it off that fucking boat. Don't give it a chance to let you sit again. So what you do is you call our mechanic, I'm not going to say his name, you call the mechanic and say, hey, I got a problem with my fucking engine. He doesn't show up with a with a truck full of, and start wrenching on your shit. He pulls up with a truck with two other guys in the truck with him. They take that fucking engine off your boat and they hang a new one on there. Well, everybody knows that does any kind of a boating at all that you just can't take a brand new engine out of a crate and put it on a boat without... Um, um, breaking it in you have to have at least 20 hours or better or that to break in an engine so what we were doing was because we were locals and we knew everybody that was a fishing guide between Everglades and 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 um, Cape Coral uh, all the backwater guides and even offshore guides we were giving them engines we'll give you a 23500 horsepower Evinru for free all you have to do is just use it and when it gets to 25 hours, call Sammy and he'll come and take it off of him and he'll give you a new one. We were having all the fishing guys breaking the motors in for us. So when we called, we already had a broken in engine already hanging on the boat ready to fucking go to work. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you do this for before it came on top? Uh, I started in on my own. I started in 1984. 
when I when I happened to take over, and and that was a pretty serendipitous uh, situation in which that happened. Um, it, it was just a case of being at the right time, at the right place at the right time, I guess you would say that cliche, and that's exactly how it turned out because um, we had worked one month. I told you we worked twenty eight nights in a row. All these crews had worked. And I wrote this in the book. And based on the calculations that I did um, on numbers and size of loads that I knew as a kid, you know, 30 tons, 40 tons, shit like that. We did 55 tons one night, just to see if we could fucking do it. In this stretch of 28 nights, we did about 1.6 million pounds in a month, in, in just two days less than a month. And um, during that time, like I said, we did that 55 ton job. Now, a boat like ours, me and the Captain Billy and, 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 and Mark and myself, three guys, a boat like that, we can only work maybe three nights tops. And we're, we got to have two, three, four days off. Other boats would jump in because there were 25, 30 boats in the fleet. Everybody was working. So that's why we could work night after night. You can't work the same crew every night because if you're moving 800 fucking pay bales a night or 1,000 bales a night to weigh 80 pounds, and sometimes you're moving them from one boat to the next two times, Dude, you're killing a motherfucker if you're working more than that, right? So we would have to have time off. Well, two days prior to this three-day stretch that I was on, one of the I was off day off, and one of the one of the brothers that was running the show and setting up the jobs and shit says, to, you know, he sees me and, and me and my buddy Jimmy and says, "Look, Jimmy, hands me a chainsaw and a wrecking bar, and he points to this brand new Winnebago motorhome." And he says, I need you guys to go in there and you strip everything out of that fucking thing you can get out of there from the windows down. I don't want plumbing. I don't want wiring. I don't want benches, couches, tables, drawers, sinks, ca not couches, nothing. Strip it the fuck down to the floor, but leave the cabinets and the curtains. So when you look in it, you can see that the cabinets and there's curtains. But if you got up and you look like, oh, there's nothing in there. We even took the captain's chairs out, the driver's chair and the, in the, you know, the passenger chair out. So there would be room there. And they took in the springs in the, uh, um, suspension springs, they put airbags inside of those and they inflated them and puffed them up like this. So when they put 11 and a half thousand pounds of bales in this fucking thing, it didn't squat down. It just sat normal. So it wasn't sparking the highway all the way to fucking Miami, right? And so I had work, got this, this thing was ready. I worked those three nights and that 55 tons filled two houses. That, that load filled two big houses on the island, just that one load. We had, at that time, almost every house that you could put pot in on the water on that island was had pot in it. I mean, it was just crazy, man. I mean, imagine a house stuffed full of fucking weed, and there's like 25 of them all around the island. And, you know, who would ever guess, right? So um, we do that 55 tons. I made $75,000 that night because I worked that job. And the next morning I get, you know, we're off, we're not working. I walk over to one of the houses that's, you know, being unloaded. And there's Daryl, the guy whose job that was. Timmy, come here, he goes. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And he says, I, um, I want you to do me a favor, if you would, please. He said, um, he said um, I'd like you to drive that van to Miami, if you would. It had 11,000, 11 and a half thousand pounds in it. What is that? 5,000 5, something kilos. And uh, I didn't really want to do it, but who, uh, because of who it was, was asking me, I said, okay, sure, why not? And he said, I need somebody I can trust. He said, the reason that is because it can't go to the spot where everybody else is going. It's not going to that plaza. You can't dead drop this fucking thing because you get within 40 feet of it. You can smell this fucking thing, right? <laughs> he said, it's got to go straight to the house that nobody's ever been to except me and my two, my three brothers. Nobody on the island of the crew ever, ever, ever knew the Cuban connections that the, the older people were working with. We ne never, nobody ever wanted to know anybody. All we knew, and even when I was getting paid, I didn't care whose job it was. I know I got a paper bag full of money slid at me. I didn't give a fuck. And he said, it's got to go to the house, the stash house. And you got to stay there all day because they're going to drive. When the loads stop coming, you can drive a car full of money home for me. That's why he needed me, somebody he trusted. And I said, okay, cool, all right, whatever, like this. So for, in order for me to drive this thing, we had to literally pull a fucking bale out, throw it out the door so I could sit down in between these fucking bales and drive this fucking behemoth, right? 
120 miles, all one direction. I got a radio and they're telling me, turn here, turn here, turn there. And I go into this orange grove over in Miami, into this house that looked like a fucking Scottish castle, for Christ's sake. There's some cocaine cowboy's idiot idea of a home, a castle. It had the spires and the fucking, I mean, the whole shit was there, right? So I pull this thing up next to the house and they start right away. They open the doors and they start putting this shit under the house. So I go inside and I meet these guys and I spend the day with them. They're drinking, playing poker. We're playing poker. I'm not drinking. They're doing coke and I'm, you know, I'm not because I got to drive home with money. And I meet these guys. Nobody ever met these guys except the adults. So why? Well, because of the barrier between our crew and their crew. Nobody knew anybody. It was always kept that way. The adults did then put the jobs together. We did. The, we brought the loads in. We take them to Miami. Our guys get out. Their guys get in. Nobody ever meets. How old were these guys now? Yeah. Uh, how old would they be yeah. now? <clears throat> My, oh, when you were doing it? Oh, they must have still been 40s, 50s, 60s. Oh, early. Yeah, I mean, they were older guys to us, but they were probably in their late 30s, early 40s, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Still young. Young, still, still young, young guys, I'm yeah. I'm thinking they're in their sixties, fucking. No, fuck no. Smuggling. Those are the guys before them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that. Did they, they still get a percentage? The ones. No, no, no. I never that. worked that way. When you no. back, when you ducked out, I mean, you just got done. You were done. You got out. You were, you didn't want to have anything to do with it because okay. you you'd had enough. You just know. because I thought they had started it, maybe they'd still get a little percentage. Like, no, no, mad, no. And that's, that's a great thought pattern as well, too, because you would think so, but no, it, it never occurred. It never, it never happened that way. It was just passed down. Okay. I'll, I'm done. You know, Totch had so much fucking money. That How much was it worth? He, he, he was fined $6 million. He was ultimately caught for tax evasion. Not for smuggling or anything, but for not paying fucking taxes, and they nail his ass. But I mean, I could go into a story about him having money under his carpeting. Yeah. You know, the carpet they came to put new carpeting down, and his wife said, "Just rip off the old carpet." You know, she moved the furniture, and they started pulling the carpet up, and there was layers thick of hundred dollar bills in twenties and fifties under this carpet in the living room, up from one corner to the, one wall to the other wall. And she goes, oh, and she walks into the kitchen, comes back with a bunch of paper bags and throws them out. Just put it in these bags, he tells the carpet guys. <laughs> so when you quit, you quit, right, sort of thing. But um, anyways, I'm over in Miami. I meet these guys simply because it was kept that way. No crew should ever meet the other crew when we never did because of, because of a, you know, if something ever happened, they could go, hey, these guys, you know, if they were ever ratted or some shit like that, could never come back to us. But I had to go that day and I wound up meeting these guys with only one of the crew in Southwest Florida that ever met those people, except for the older, you know, the older guys that were running the show. Were they American, Colombian, who were they? Uh, they were Cuban. Cuban. Yeah, Cubans. Cubans moving Colombian material because, like I said earlier, you got to have a gringo, and all the white dudes would manage the jobs because those people never trusted one another. They trust the gringo in the middle to do the job, but they didn't trust one another, so we always had to work that way. That's why we were the middlemen. We didn't want to own it, and I said, we'll move your shit for you. We'll go from Colombia to you. You guys don't have to meet. That was the, that was the, the, the arrangement, and we got paid very well for it, but Having said what I said about meeting those guys, then comes this first operation of Everglades, and then a year later comes the second operation, which was successful because they said just, you know, the government guys that they had a payroll should just give up because they're not going to quit. Well, two in the morning, they're sitting around smoking cigarettes on the front porch waiting for the fucking show to start, you know, and then they start arresting people. They took the brothers. They took everybody visible, everybody that they were kind of had an idea of what was going on. It wasn't a lot of people. But in their network between Everglades and Miami and Kentucky, there was about 230 people, something like that. But what they didn't know was the kids, us guys, were the infrastructure. We were doing all the work. We knew everything there was A to Z about that fucking work, but they didn't know those kids were involved. Because, like I said earlier several times, they didn't know to the extent to which this was taking place. They had no fucking glue. So when they took all these other guys... One of the guys I met at that house that day came find came looking for me. They knew what I looked like, and they knew Timmy. So they started in Everglades. Timmy, 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 Timmy. And they worked their way into Naples. Timmy, and they found where, out where I lived. And there, there's one day George knocking on my door, and there's this open, and there's this Cuban dude I met in that house. He goes, Timmy! <laughs> like we've been buddies all this time, right? We haven't worked for a month or better because everybody got busted during Operation Everglades, right? He says, dude, we got work backing up. He says, man, we got stuff to do. He said, can you do this? 
And I didn't give it a second thought. I just blurted it. Oh, hell yeah, man. We can do this. You know, so I went back to Everglades and I got the crew together, the guys that were closest to me in the upper echelon, you know, and I said, look, we can go back to work, man. Here we go. And it was at that point I had to seek out one of the older generations to find out where in the fuck do I go in Jamaica? Where do I go in Colombia? Where do I go in Panama? Where do I go in uh, Costa Rica? Where do I go in Belize, Honduras to buy the weed? Because we had generational families in all of those places. And I inherited some of those connections from these, from the older generations. So now I know how much to charge. I know where to go. I know who to see. And I'm taking off, you know, and Carlito and Leo, two Cuban guys, the only two people I mentioned in Miami, the only two people I ever worked with, I ever saw. Uh, you have somebody, some cocaine cowboy in Miami that wants to buy weed, whatever amount they want, you get the money, you give it to me. I don't want to know these fucking people. I'll deal with you. I'll give you the, the fucking shit. You deal with them. I don't want to know anybody. I only knew two Cubans in Miami, and they were bringing me the money, and I was buying shit all over the fucking Caribbean, dude. You know, load after load after load. I went to work, and we put everybody back to work, and that's when we started amping up the game, changing the boats, changing the mechanics, changing the way we operated. <clears throat> I had a one guy on my crew was an Everglades National Park Ranger, and he was on my crew. And he was, um, he had, it introduced me to a uh, government counter surveillance technologist expert, a Cuban guy in Miami that the government bought all their shit from. I was buying as good, if not better, counter surveillance technology than the government had <laughs> because I had a war chest of money that so far surpassed theirs. I could buy anything, right? And so I had, uh, I had, um, at that time, wasn't re it wasn't infrared, it was Starlight Scope. They were, uh, it was uh, night vision developed in the, during Vietnam. Um, it would gather, you know, all the light, <coughs> accumulated light, and you could see in the dark. But if somebody lit a match, you'd go blind and shit like that. So I had night vision. I had a parabolic microphone that you put on the earphones, and you see them on, on football games where they have the little dish that they aim at the thing. They can hear the players. Well, we had these things, and the shore crew could listen up one, end, one shoreline and down the other shoreline. Three miles away, if so, if if somebody was down there and they farted, you'd know they were there. You know, we had this shit covered. We handheld radar. You just sweep it like that and look at it, and you could see what was ever out there. But we had the shit, and um, so that's what I meant by amping up the game. So what what wound up happening was through the the evolution of this whole entire thing from start to finish, the bales in the very beginning were nasty. They weren't compacted. They were just just. Pillow bales, we called them. They were mostly like somebody put their foot in a bag and stuffed it like this and taped it off and put it in a, uh, you know, a, a burlap bag, a coffee bag or a sugar bag or something like that and then stitched that shut. Um, we were at one time, you know, in the earlier days, dude, oh, Jesus Christ, you get the load off the boat, put it on ours, we get our boats to come and get it, we take it off and they go to the house, that shit. We go offshore to clean up the boat. And sometimes we would be sweeping shit into piles wheat bud scooping it up with an ice shovel and throwing it overboard just cleaning the nasty shit off the boat because it was fucked up we did that several times and we said fuck this shit and then next time we went out we had um plastic rolled up ball, uh, rolls of plastic and we rolled them out there and, and duct taped them over the edge of the boat and made a bowl out of the entire ass end of the fucking boat so we could unload this nasty fucking shit that was coming to us in the early days, get it to off of our boat. They'd get it inshore, them poor bastards. We'd go offshore, and now instead of spending hours with the, you know, in the corners and the cracks and shit, we just pull that plastic up together, put a chain and an anchor on it, and throw it overboard. <laughs> because if something suspicious should ever occur and our boat was stopped, then one seed on that boat would get our boat taken from us. You know, that's how, you know, that's just how it worked in those days. So the older generation said after a while, they said, look, fuckers down, you know, they went to South America and they said, look, you got to have a better way. This is just, we're responsible for when we get your shit to get it to Miami, we're responsible for it. And it's coming in ways that's just so fucking nasty. I mean, it, it, they weren't bales. I mean, compressed what a, people, what a person looks at now as a bale of pot. They weren't like that. So what they did was in the earlier in the earlier eighties were the advent of the commercial and household trash compactor. So one of the older generation went, Hey, 
he grabbed about six of those compactors and a couple of generators and went down to the jungle and said, hey, look here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what you need to start doing. So they start compacting these things, you know, little bits at a time. Next thing you know, they're coming out 80 pounds, 70, 80 pounds, all the same size, all the same weight, easier to handle. Now the loads are getting heavier. They're getting bigger because they're easier to handle. They're easier to stack. So now we're doing more. Now, as kids, and we inherit this, you know, this, this, the pot game, now we're doing loads that are, you know, just enormous, you know, and out of this fucking world. I mean, I know a lot of people out there, you know, have, have their, you know, the, their questions about, you know, authenticity and this and that and, and validation. But I can guarantee you I have, you know, every government agency that was involved in my case has validated this story because they discovered, after all, finally just how big of fools that we were making out of them because it came a day when, um, of course, it all comes to an end at some point or other. You know, and my day finally came one day, and it happened um, one night. I was doing fifty-seven thousand pounds. I was bringing two, bringing it into two different places, and uh, went to the northern crew because Pine Island, because I worked with them just several times. I let the Everglades crew. I knew that I grew up with them guys. I, I knew they could handle their shit. Well, halfway through the job, the, the shit quit coming, and everybody got radios. And the guy I had spotting out by the road said, Timmy, he said, hey, dude, somebody just pulled up in here with a car and backed out and went out. You know, we're in bumfuck nowhere land out on this island in, in, in Pine Island north of here or north of Everglades. And, and uh, there should have been nobody out there. And right away I get this chill down my back going, oh, what the fuck? So I started walking out there because I knew something was wrong. By the time I got out there and I asked him again, tell me what the fuck happened. I look around. I see everybody that was back there helping me bring boats in and load this. We had a, a box truck backed in back there that we were loading bring the loads in and throwing it right into the truck it was going to go right straight to miami and um he starts telling me this and as he's telling me this these everybody was standing behind me next thing i know all i can hear is tire mark tire sound cars coming down this fucking road that i couldn't see because of the trees you know you know what i'd like 20 cars sounds like when they're roaring down the fucking road next thing you know i begin to see headlights and everybody runs I ran about 20 feet to this, you know, this direction, and it was a bit of palmetto field that's only about this tall, like this. And it's crunch and crunch, and they grow together, you know. And, and, and I got 20 feet in there, and that first car pulled in, and I had to duck down. I was so close to this fucking guy. When he got out of his Bronco, out of his truck, I could look through the palmetto bushes and see his feet. That's how close I was to this fucking guy because that's all the further I ran. Everybody else took off to a pine tree forest over here this direction. And they got off down in there. And I could hear these guys. There's some running over there. There's guys running over there. You know, and your car's taking off and squealing. Every, you know, it was a free-for-all. And the, the Bronco guy, he gets back in his and he backs out and he takes off. And a couple minutes later, he come back. But at that time, it was gone. Another car had pulled up. I heard it pull up out front because I'm in the... At the end of this fucking half-ass road that went back to this old dock, broken down dock we were using, and the road wasn't, you know, maybe 30 meters, 20 meters in front of me, you know, and I heard a car pull up out there. This guy comes back and gets out, and he starts to walk in front of his vehicle because I can see his feet. And the guy, whoever was out in that car, says, where are you going? What are you doing? This guy whose feet I'm watching says, I'm going to walk back in there and see what we got. And now it's been a couple of hours. The sun's coming up. And here I am sitting right here in the middle of this fucking thing. And, the, and dude, all he had to do was look over and he could see me. That's how close I was to the motherfucker. And, so, and I knew as soon as the sun come up, my ass was hat. So I hear this guy tell the dude walking, hang on, I'll walk back there with you. And I'm thinking, oh, fuck, this is my chance, man. You know, but he left the car running in, out in the street. They go walking back into the back, you know, it was a good ways back into the woods. And I give them about a minute and a half or so. And I'm thinking to myself, now the sun's up. I mean, I mean, it's up light enough to see my ass. And I'm thinking, if there's another motherfucker in that car, one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to run his ass over and knock him the fuck out or he's going to shoot me, you know, something like that. And I peeped up over like that and there was nobody in that fucking car. I took off like a fucking jackrabbit, man. I ran across the road, through the ditch, and into the woods. And I must have ran. I ran till I couldn't breathe. I couldn't run any longer. I dove under a pile of bushes and covered myself up with branches and leaves. And I laid there. And I was waiting and listening for whoever might have been running after me, who might have saw me. Nobody saw me. Nobody came after me. 
I laid there all day and I could hear the helicopters flying around and I could hear the shit going on back in the woods, you know, a mile or two away, banging my truck through the trees, trying to pull it out of there and shit. And I stood out there all day and all that afternoon and it just started getting dark and I'm laying there all covered up in leaves and shit like this, you know. And all of a sudden I hear this sounded like, you know, a footstep and then another footstep. And I'm like, what in the fuck, you know, and I got shit piled up like this and I I'm, you know I kind of dozed off and I opened my eye up and I looked over like this and there's a fucking bobcat doing this creeping up on me and he was a good he was only an arm's length away from me that's how close he got to me before I heard him I noticed him and this motherfucker was he was 90 pounds he was a good you know 40 kilos if he was you know a, a kilo and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, in my mind and my, my internal monologue's going off like, you know, God, I just spent the whole night and the day getting away from the fucking law, and now I'm going to get eaten by this fucking thing. Right? <laughs> and it just, it, I don't know what happened. It just came to me. I leaped up out, and I threw them fucking sticks and leaves in the air, and I screamed as loud as I could, and that fucking thing jumped about four feet in the air, did three somersaults, and took off through the woods like it was shot out of a cannon. <laughs> and I said, I got to go. So I walked my way three miles on the side of the road to an old fish house that was still open at 2.30 in the morning because the fish boat were coming in. When that boat came in and the crew unloaded and went, and there was one parking lot, all the lights were on, and, a, and, and this is the days before the cell phone. There's a phone box in the middle of the parking lot, but all the goddamn lights are on, and the lights are on in this fish house. And I'm wondering, how the fuck am I going to get? I'm cleaning myself. How am I going to get from here out to the end of that fucking thing without somebody noticing? Where the fuck did he come from? Well, these boats, after they unloaded, the crews got to the phone and started lining up, calling for their ride home. So I went, oh, okay, cool. So I kind of slipped my way around the corner, went around and got in line with the fucking guys, right? So I was part of the crew. When it came my turn to get in the phone, I went right to the phone book into the taxi. I called the first one that I saw. And I told the guy, look, you show the fuck up as soon as you can. I'll give you $600 and $100 bills cash just to show up. Plus, I'll give you your fare if you just come and get me and take me to a hotel. I've been fishing for three weeks, man. I'm, I need, I want to get home. And, and while I'm on the phone talking to him, a sheriff's deputy. Now, this is like 2.33 in the morning now. Sheriff's deputy pulls in, and he goes real slow around the parking lot. And he goes around back behind me, and he goes right out that other entrance, and he went back down, and he disappeared down the road. And I said, dude, you need to hurry the fuck up. <laughs> Hung the phone up. He said, you sure? You promised about that, that money, right? I said, dude, just show up. He showed up 30 minutes later. First thing I did was threw $600 bills in his fucking lap, and I got in the back seat and slumped down like that. I said, take me to Punta Gorda and find me a fucking hotel. <laughs> and I got out of there. And it turns out everybody else did. But they were watching us. They knew we, obviously, they had been watching us and knew where we were. So when we met at the hotel prior to going out to where the unloading spot was, we kept seeing this Bronco driving around like it was some Yankee from up north was lost in the parking lot or some shit. That's what we thought until I saw it in the woods. That, that was that fucking Bronco. So they knew. So my buddies and everybody got away. But when he ran back, they got back to their van at that hotel. They were sitting there waiting on him. <clears throat> detained them, questioned them. They weren't caught at the scene. Nobody was. So they couldn't hold them for that. They could just question them, ask them these questions about where you were and this and that. They went through the van. My wallet and my checkbook was in the back of that fucking van. So they come after me in a couple of days and said, oh, you know this guy, Mark, and this and that. And you're, I said, well, yeah, I grew up. He's my best buddy. I said, you know, your wallet and your identification, everything was in the back of his van. We saw one night that uh, some incident out in Pine Island took place, you know, a, a smuggling incident. I said, well, I don't know anything about that. I said, you know, I, I could have left my wallet in his van. You know, I'm in, you know, we're buddies. I'm with him all the time. But that wasn't flying, man. You know, then comes the investigation and all the other shit. Next thing you know, I'm indicted. And I'm indicted for just under 400,000 pounds. And... At my arraignment, they the judge read off my sentence. Read my sentence. You know what I was looking at, and I had four indictments, four counts on each indictment. Each indictment was a mandatory ten years to life. There was sixteen of them, so my sentence was one hundred and sixty years mandatory to life and sixteen million dollars in fines. 
and there's seven of us being arraigned all at the same time. We're standing side by side, and and Teddy, this fucking clown, he was a kid. Well, we were all kids. This jerk off's next to me. And he hears the the fine, sixteen million, and he looks over at me, and he looks up at her, and she he goes, "Why don't you make it thirty million, Your Honor?" <laughs> What the fuck? You're going to make it 16? Make it 30. She got pissed, dude. She took her glasses off, her reading glasses. She threw them down on the desk, and she looked at me. She said, Mr. McBride, she said, this is not funny. She said, you're in serious fucking trouble. She said, the men and the women of this country didn't fight World War I, World War II, Korea and Vietnam for you to mess it up with drugs. And I knew right then my asshole went, whoop. I knew I was had right there because she said, she literally said, and it was quoted in the newspaper as saying, I have a mission beyond my job. And right then I knew my ass was fucking had, dude. And she, her position was given to her by Ronald Reagan. And Reagan was the one that created and started the war on drugs here in the United States. And Nancy Reagan was the just say no. You know, that theme was going on around and that kind of shit. So on my ass, I knew my ass was hung out the fucking dry, dude. But, um, you know. Did you, did you make a deal? Well, you know what? One thing led to another. And, you know, the interesting thing about the story is quite simply this. Um, and it was done by design rather than by accident. And I didn't discover this until years later when I started putting the book together and all these other agents that were involved in my case and now became my friends for fuck's sake, which is blowing my mind at times when I think about it, but only because of the nonviolent nature in which we were doing this. We were family and generational and never violent because if you're a parent and you think about it, what fucking parent in their right mind would send their kids offshore to meet a boat from another country if they thought they were going to get killed doing it? No parent would ever do that. So this is the scenario that they understood, you know. So um, when they when they changed the federal sentencing guidelines to mandatory minimums, which is what changed the whole ball game, because their the sentences they were giving out prior weren't having the desired effect that they wanted. The five brothers that were the second generation that were our kids and our fathers and uncles. And, and cousins, a year prior, you know, the five brothers are being sentenced in federal court in Miami, and the judge is reading off their list of seizures. They've got a Netherlands Antilles holding company worth $14 million. They've got untold properties throughout the Caribbean. In the United States, they have houses, boats, planes, cars, trucks, vans, motels, hotels, timeshares, um, properties all over the fucking place and plus they seized 580,000 pounds of cannabis of Caribbean marijuana now who in the fuck has what's that 250 something thousand kilos who the fuck has that laying around well we did at that time right so the judge he's literally this magistrate is going through this paperwork and they're lined up ready to be you know sentenced and he's reading off the, the read off the seizures, and he looks at him, and he goes, gentlemen, he says, I have absolutely no idea how to sentence people like you. I have never come across in my years as a magistrate, come across people quite like yourself. There are no guidelines for people like you, he says. <laughs> so the four brothers, the four older brothers, and Craig was the youngest brother, the one that befriended Tosh and got them involved in it years, years ago. This was his second time because he'd gotten busted with a, you know, a, a, on a boat with some shit in it before. And the judge reminded him, this is your second time now. So he's, he goes along and, and he looks at the other four brothers and he looks them straight in the eye and he goes, I'm going to give you 36 months. <laughs> 36 months, he gives them two and a half fucking years, dude. That 36 months for flooding North America with fucking weed because the guidelines didn't provide for anything else other than, you know, what the judge could come up with in his head. And he thought, well, okay, three, how's three, you know, how's 36 months now? When he gets to Craig and uh, he reminds him again, this is your second time, Mr. Daniels. You, yes, sir, I understand. He says, um, he says, once again, I don't know how to deal with people like you. I've never come across to people, you know, like you. He looks him dead in the eye and he says, does five years sound like a long time to you? <laughs> Craig, Craig, and I'm reading the transcripts as Craig is telling me this, and I'm making notes for my book. And um, Craig says, oh, yes, sir, that sounds like a hell of a long time. <laughs> Gave him five fucking years. So will you take that and contrast it against the, the life sentence that they want to give us kids the next year? 
well, you just put our fathers, uncles, and dads and shit away for, you know, two and a half years. And some were 13 months, some were 10 months, some were eight months, you know, depending on your culpability yeah, and shit like that. A slap in the well, dust. you can't turn around the very next year and put your kids in jail for for the rest of their life for the exact same thing you put the father in jail for for 12 months. Why did they? Well, because they needed to stop it. They changed this federal sentencing guidelines from what they used to be to mandatory minimums. So now when you get caught doing what we were getting caught doing and the others got caught doing, you got 10 years, on, you got 40 years to life on one indictment. They needed to make the, the punishment more suitable to the crime to deter the crime from happening in the first place because the sentence they were giving out weren't working. Mm -hmm. Fuck, a guy would get popped with, say, on a boatload of fucking shit or on a van load of shit or whatever, every occasionally like that. He'd go to prison for eight, 10 months or whatever, 12 months, get you know, good time off of that. We'd keep his lights on, his family fed, and you know, the, the dog food, the dog fed, and when he gets home, it put him right back to work again. That's how we operated for years. Well, the government changed that scenario when the government, when the guidelines changed, we didn't know it. We were operating under the assumption that, oh, we're gonna get the same thing everybody else got if we ever got nabbed. Well, no, sir. -y. It took a guy that was on our crew to get in trouble in Colombia, put in prison for a cocaine deal, and the government, knowing that he was part of the Everglades crew, went down there, promised to get him out of that Colombian prison if he would come back and go to work for them. Well, he came back and went to work for them. Put him right back into work with our crew. That's how they got inside. And this guy that they got just happened to be one of the chase boat drivers, the guy that I told you that rides along the load boat. If the boat gets coming to you, you get in and you go away. He was in the, on the job in the very beginning. So they knew that Pine Island job was going to take place because of him. In the meantime, he's telling some of these other younger kids because um, there were 20-year-old kids running boats to the islands even when I was a kid, run, you know, and I had 20-year-old kids running boats for me too. He picking on these younger kids saying, look, dude, the, you know, the game's changed. Here's the deal. The cops are coming for you. You know, this is game over. And they're coming at you with 40 years mandatory to life sentences unless you cooperate with them, unless you give them information that's useful for them to continue their investigation and complete their task. Well, you tell a fucking 20-year-old kid, a 21-year-old kid, 40 years to life, he's going to tell his grandma and his grandpa we're doing it, you know, everything else, shit. So what wound up happening was the domino effect. And, but within the body of this agreement that the government was getting out was an immunity clause saying that we'll give you immunity from prosecution, from everything and anything that you've done, which will allow you to openly and freely tell us about what you've been involved in. But we'll hold one count back so we could got to give you something. You know, we can give you probation. We can give you a year. We can go under the mandatory now because you've cooperated with us. So they gave them this deal. Well, it turns out they wound up giving everybody the fucking deal. So if, say, I had the deal and I come to you and, and two other people and I say, dude, they've got all of your names, you're coming, you're next, they're coming for you. And when they do, they're going to offer you this deal to cooperate. And in that body of that deal is, a, is an agreement for, you know, immunity so you can cooperate with them. So give them Jimmy, Teddy, and Willie's name when you cooperate because they've already taken the deal with, for immunity. You can't hurt them. <laughs> so everybody's telling on everybody that's already got a deal and they're getting out of it so this was the back door the government gave to these to us to get out of it you know cooperate tell on but it didn't matter to them either that they were hearing a lot of the same names because all that told them was they're getting all the right people but when it comes to some poor fucker like me and they want to know who's in Miami, who's in Colombia, who's in Cuba, who's in... I worked for the president of fucking Panama, Manuel Noriega. I did three jobs for that piece of shit, cocksucker. Never met him. Got a handwritten note from him one day from, from George, the Cuban buddy of mine in Miami, because of one job that I did for him, which we can do at another time maybe. But um, 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 so it came, you know, it came, it came strictly down to... Um, you know, me being able to 
not being able to tell them who I was working with because all the years of nonviolence in, in the way in which we were working. But you take one of these son of a bitches, these fucking Cubans or one of these posse gang, gang members from Ra, from Jamaica and you throw their ass under the bus, they're going to come at you and do just exactly what they do the best. And that's kill you, your family, and your cousins, your, your and the goldfish and the dog because they don't give a fuck. So you can, you're not getting that out of me. So I couldn't cooperate with them. I had, I had 160 fucking years to life and I still, because that would have been the end of it. Even though we weren't violent, you throw these fuckers under the bus, they're going to kill somebody. So I had to take my lumps. So one day, after about three months of, of this bullshit, I'm in county lockup, you know, waiting for my sentencing to, you know, to go through and my, my lawyer to make his deals or whatever he's going to do. They start bringing me out to question me. They want to know. Uh, first of all, they take me in there, and there's two treasury agents, and they tell me, they sit down and show me their gold badges, and I'm like, oh, fuck. Prosecutor, state prosecutor, U.S. prosecutor next room hears me say that into the microphone, and she comes busting through the door. She goes, Timmy, this is not about cooperation. This is not about anything like that. What we'd like to know is, if you're willing to tell us, is how you were able to do this for over 10 years, and we couldn't forget you. And I said, oh, game's over. I can tell you that. I can tell you how stupid your asses are. But I won't tell you any people. I won't give you any names. If you can glean from what I'm telling you any names out of this, then, you know, more puck and power to you. But you, know, you won't get them from me. So I proceeded over the next month and a half, every, every you know, twice a week, they take me out of my jail cell, handcuff me, belly shackle me, shackles on my ankles and a shackle from my wrist to my ankles, and I do the convict shuffle around the corner to the federal building in the morning. Good morning, good morning to these people I'm passing on the sidewalk, right? They take me in this little room and they question me about all this shit, about the money, about the amounts, about the volumes, what we're doing and all this kind of shit. And, you know, after about three, four weeks of this shit, they take me out one day and they take me past that room and into another little, even smaller room with one guy in there, one table and two chairs, and he's sitting in one operating up polygraph machine, a lie detector machine, because they're not believing what I'm telling them. There's no fucking way that this can be happening the way you say it's happening. So I go in and they hook me up. 20 minutes later, I walk out with this big fucking grin on my face. And I look back at these other assholes and they're back there scratching their head going, Jesus Christ, he passed the fucking thing with flying colors. He wasn't telling a lie. He was telling the truth. And this is when they finally discovered that that first 400,000 pounds nearly that I was busted with, that was only one week's work. And, I, and it took a polygraph for them to be convinced of that. Now they understand, holy fucking shit, did we hit the jack by here, you know? So what happened to me was, by my way of giving them this invaluable information about how it all worked, I told them from A to Z because, okay, game's over. I can tell you how it's done. I can tell you how we got by you. I mean, imagine every single fucking day of the of the season of the growing of the harvest season in Colombia. There's forty thousand or forty tons at any one day coming off of that island. This is what they weren't believing me until they passed that test, and then now they understood the significance of what they, of what what it was they did, and what wound up happening was because of the cooperation, they didn't deem it cooperation significant enough. So when I got sentenced, the judge took in consideration that, you know, my million point, $1.2 million attorney made a deal for me, did not give me more than 20, but you couldn't give me less than 10. She had to hit me somewhere in the middle like that. And I could live with that after all, after, after life sentences, fuck yeah, I'll do fucking 20 years if I have to. Well, I go to sentencing and she looks at me and she goes, Mr. McBride, she says, um, um, you know, in, in lieu of and in light of the information which is invaluable to us that you provided with, you know, with your way of life, she said, I'm agreeable to, you know, with the prosecuting attorney to allow you to, to give you a 10 years mandatory sentence rather than, you know, the maximum 10 or 20. And she said, what I'd like you to do, sir, is um, I'm sending you to Tallahassee, Florida, Federal Correctional Institution in Tallahassee, which is the hub within the Bureau, Federal Bureau of Prisons for education. So if you want to, if you're in the Federal Bureau of Prisons somewhere in the United States and you want to get a degree or an education or something like that, you, while you apply for transfer to Tallahassee where they bring in civilian professors and teachers and shit, and they have a whole compound dedicated to education. And she said, I'm sending you there because I'd like you to take advantage of this facility in order to gain the knowledge in order to, when you get out, 
be able to make the kind of money that you're accustomed to making. Oh, dude. I come this close to laughing out loud in her fucking face. <laughs> right away, I'm thinking to myself, where in the fuck are you going to send me where I'm going to learn how to make two and a half million dollars a night? <laughs> I'm thinking, what the fuck? But I kept my mouth shut because this is my inner monologue again going off. And she wound up, she said, I'm going to give you 10 years, Mr. McBride. And I'm right away, whoosh, whoosh, I can live with that, you know. My family's crying and all this shit, which is just understandable. You know, I made my father cry for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. I ever saw my father cry. And that, that killed me right there. But um, I had to take my lumps and I wound up, you know, designated to Tallahassee. But um, moving forward here, um, you know, toward the end is um, once I'm in prison, you get there. Now you have to work. You're assigned a job. My job when I first got there was prison construction, being a handyman, fixing this, working that, building this, all kind of shit. It was an older prison. They were doing updates and this thing. I told my workout partner, I don't want to fucking do this. I don't want to build this fucking place, dude. I don't, I'm, you know, who the fuck wants to build this fucker? He was working. He had already been there. He had a job as a, um, a clerk in the law library, the legal library in the education building. And every federal institution and state institution in the United States, by law, is required to give their, their prisoners access to legal material. So we have a complete law library, the same thing any attorney or prosecuting attorney would have, we have. So if somebody wants to come and work on their case and review their case and look up for you know, appeals or whatever you know, one might be, there are clerks there that can guide them through the process of how to look up their cases and work on their shit. Well, I said, he said, well, I can get you, see if I can get you a job down there. Well, I went down and met Dennis Lehman, the head convict of the law library, who was a, a prison, uh, uh, in for bank robbery. He's been in for 32 fucking years when I met him already, 32 years. And um, he liked me right away. Right away, it's Timmy, Timmy, Timmy this, Timmy that. I got the job. All the changes and all the paperwork went through, and I was moved, and I be became a law clerk. And over the, the few years that I was a law clerk, I took it upon myself and with Rolando to do a, a, a correspondence course to the University of Honolulu, and I got, my, I got a degree in literary arts in, in writing, and I also at the same time got a law degree. I got a paralegal a degree, a, 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 a associate's degree as a paralegal. So I can do everything a, an attorney can do to this point, except go into the court and litigate. This is the knowledge that I provided myself with. So I said, if I'm going to work in this fucking law library, I got to understand this shit. So I took it upon myself to go the route that I always go, you know, do the best that I can do at what it is I'm doing. And in the process of doing so, we're working with the materials that the same materials that the prosecutor that prosecuted me is working with, which is the one of them, which is being the uh, what's described as the Black's Law Dictionary. And that is the dictionary by which all um, prosecuting and defense attorneys use to define the legal ease that's used within the legal structure. Um, the. Um, the definitions from Latin to American to 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 English and and you know define them under the legal terms. Well, I'm flipping through this fucking book one day, sitting at my desk, and I'm looking, and I come to the word cooperation, and I read what they've written in this Black's Dictionary regarding cooperation, and it simply says that if you ask me for something and I provide it for you, I've cooperated with you. Well, Jesus Christ, they wanted my fine. I gave it to them. They wanted to know how all this fucking shit works. And for months, I, you know, week, you know, for week after week after week, I told them how this was done. I think I gave them what they wanted. So I took it upon myself to write my own brief to the middle district, United States Middle District Courts of Florida for reduction of sentence based on cooperation because of citing cases that I went through all this case law because I knew how to do it now and cite all this different case law whereby if somebody, and in the United States, um, laws are, are um, governed by what's called precedent law. Precedent being you can't be judged for a crime differently than I can be judged for the same crime. And what you do is you go through the, all these law books. When you see a movie and you see an attorney's or a barrister's office and they've got all these books on the shelves behind them that all look the same, those are all the different laws that have been made. So in the United States, when you're looking for laws similar to yours, you do what's called shepherdizing. I had to learn this through, through my courses, through my, um, through my studies. And you find cases with wording similar to yours that, that, that back up your case. So you can't be adjudicated differently than anybody else. You have to be adjudicated the same. 
So the laws are uniformed like this. And you cite case law out of different cases that, that say, this is true. This is how this happens. This is why I should be. And, and you cite those cases. And what wound up happening was I sent my brother to the hearing and I, I went from 10 years to four. She cut four, she cut six years off my sentence. I was only expecting like one or two. Cause I mean, that day, Teddy pissed her off next to us by saying that fucking what he said to her, you know, by that comment about we couldn't get this. He says, we couldn't get that shit in here fast enough. He's telling her, right. You know? And, um, I thought, you know, what the fuck, but she cut six years and I, I was already, by that time I'm in three and a half years. I got, now I'm six months from going home. I got myself out of that fucking place. Man. Did, they, did they seize any money? Did they seize any property? Because obviously in the UK, we've got a thing called proceeds of crime, but that never came out to the 2000s. Right. I think a new law, but did they seize anything? Or any well, other? besides what I paid in fines, um, they did seize several homes that I had here in the United States. Which How I much fine did you get? They went from 16 million to four. Did you have to give them four million? In cash. They wanted a cashier's check, and I said, fuck you. You take this and get a cashier's check. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so um, I had, um, oh, they're going to love if they ever hear this. I had five other houses throughout the Caribbean that I just abandoned. I never went back. I just let them go. I had a, that house that I got in the, in the Bahamas. That was one of them. I had a house in Panama. I had a house in Colombia. I had a house in Aruba. I had a house in St. Martin. Um and uh, just never went back because I, I never wanted to acknowledge that I had that I owned that property, and God, who the fuck knows whatever happened to it? I don't care. I had to go through what I had to go through, and if you're going to throw a life sentence at me, I don't give a flying fuck. And when it comes to the money, I'm spending that shit, dude. <laughs> I'm giving it away to my family. I'm giving it away to my friends. I'm not leaving you shit. If I'm going away for fucking life, dude, you ain't getting dick out of me. So I did my damnedest to get rid of what I could get rid of, however much I could get rid of. I wound up buying up, an, um, <laughs> I bought an IROC Camaro, brand new. Um, um, I'd only had like 12 miles on it. And I did that as a joke, just to get rid of some, you know, some fucking money. I paid 22,000, 23,000, I think in 86. That's a lot of money for, for a car in 1980, oh, 1988 rather. That's a lot of money in those days for a car. So what I did was, um, I had dealt with so many dealerships around that, around that town, you know, that knew me buying cash for cars and shit. I knew all the salesmen and everything like this. So I go by the Chevy dealer and I see one of these old salesmen from a Nissan dealership. He's working here now. So I go to the, to the owner of the dealership who I know because I bought his son's Corvette from him that day we got all the Jeeps. And I said, look, here's what I want to do. I'm going to buy this car from you. I'm going to pay cash for it right now. Tomorrow I'm going to send a, a guy in here to test drive that car. And I want that salesman right there. And I pointed through the window. I said, I want him to sell him the car if you can arrange that. So my buddy goes in there the next day. The owner, Bob Ta Taylor Chevrolet, and his son, you know, they pointed out there to the guy and like this. And I told him, I told him, this is what you do. You go on this test drive. There's a Kmart just not even two blocks down the street. And what I need you to do is, and they have, you know, in this big old parking lot, they have the lights for at night. But they have big cement buttresses at the bottom of them in case somebody should bump into one. I said, I'd like you just to drive up there and see how many of them fucking things you can hit before you come back. <laughs> he takes this salesman down there in this test drive and he comes back and there's no windows in this car. The doors are about to fall off. It's all dented in. The front car, the front is smashed in and it's steam and there's no windshield. It's all cracked out. He's driving with his head out the window like this and he pulls back into the dealership and i can hear this in i'm standing there with the owner and his son and we can hear this salesman i can't see him because the window's all cracked up he's screaming and yelling motherfucking this and that he gets out and as soon as he opens the door and he looks out and he sees me standing there with a grin on my face you motherfucker he starts yelling <laughs> <laughs> gig was up because the owner's laughing the son's laughing everybody we set this guy up it was, it was just funny as fucking hell man just destroyed that brand new guy rock camaro <laughs> how was prison how did you handle uh, prison? prison prison was um i was in what's called medium i was four i was a level four five that's the next level is maximum security i was a, considered a flight risk an escape risk so i spent my time behind um, uh, double wire fences 
with a razor wire killing field in between and shaded windowed gun towers every about 60 feet, about every 30, about every 20 meters or so is a gun tower with two officers in it with two rifles that you can't see that'll shoot you in a minute if you touch that fucking fence, you know. And 24-7, 365 days a year, there's two pickup trucks that circle the outer compound with guards with rifles in them. This is the prison that I was sent to. Plus the units that we were ha that we were housed in in Florida had no air conditioning. This was like, have you ever seen Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. This was a Shawshank type prison. This was a motherfucking, this was like old, ready to fall apart. But um, um, the people in it at that time, we're not talking about gangs and none of this kind of shit. You know, there were people that hung out with their own race and things like that. But for the most part, everybody got along okay, you know. And at one point, at, at one point in time, because there were so many people involved in this case, 270 people ultimately wound up getting busted because of, you know, an Operation Peacemaker, which, which took me and, and all five crews. Um, there are only so many federal prisons in South Flor South, you know, southeastern United States, and the government is, um, you know, um, obliged to send you at a place where your family has the ability to visit you. You know, they try to get you close to your family members that you can visit. Well, at one time, after two years, I think it was, there was about 23 of us from 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 the same place, all in the same prison. <laughs> Even you're doing that for three generations and never been busted. What was? How did they end up catching on? What happened? Did anybody snatch? Did anybody get caught? Like how did they catch on where what you were doing? Well, that's where the guy in Colombia came in. So it was him when they got him out of prison and they put him. They said, "Look, we'll get you out. We'll put you right back to work. We need you to get inside this place for us and tell us who's who." That's when he. They put him right back to work with us. We didn't know where he went. When they, when these guys aren't hauling pot for me or whoever, I don't give a fuck what you're doing. Well, this guy got caught up in a fucked up co cocaine deal in Colombia and got put in prison. The United States government found out who he was and went and got him out and said, here, help us with this. We'll get you out of here. They put him back to work with us. That's how it started. He started to picking on the younger guys and saying, look, like I said, 40 years buck and you're fucked now it's time to turn over it's time to, you know to do the right thing because if you don't cooperate with these fucking guys they're serious as fuck you're going to prison for 40 fucking years bang 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 that's what started like i said earlier the domino effect yeah 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 yeah, yeah. everybody tell there was a one yeah. person that did it one person that started it see all. when your organizations get, gets took down does it become a dry up Yep. See in the UK because you must have been flooded, not just America, but but the world. See, you know, there's a dry up in the UK sometimes heroin or coke. Nobody's got it. But with the shipments that you're bringing in, did America go dry with weed? No, no. What wound up happening was, at that time in in 1988 and 1989, um, and I was told this by the uh, supervisor for Homeland Security here in in South Florida, where I come from. He he called me one day because we have a mutual friend with our family doctor, and he got my information from my family doctor to call me, and he introduced himself and said, "Would you mind coming and talking to me? I I wouldn't mind meeting a legend." He called me, and I said, "I started laughing at him." I said, "What the fuck are you talking about? Come and see me if you're willing, and let's have a talk." Well, I went and see this guy. What he wound up telling me was quite simply that when they did Operation Peacemaker, which was taking me and all the other five crews out of southwest Florida, that literally ended Caribbean marijuana from coming into the United States. The paradigm shift took place at that time, and the shift was simply that the Mexican cartels, the Sinaloa, they've been around for a while. There's nothing new about these fucking people. And a guy by the name of Guiardo, who was huge before Chapo and his father were even huge. He was running the marijuana. He was running the weed. Now, the Mexican cartels at that time, there was only a couple of them, maybe two or three at that time. Um, they could grow the marijuana. They could grow the opium poppy to create the heroin, but they couldn't grow the coca plant. They still, had to, they still needed the Colombians' cocaine. So when the United States government intervened in Miami and cut off that shit coming into Miami, killed, got rid of Griselda Blanco and everybody else that was running the cocaine, put Carlos Slater out of business and put him in witness protection, put George Young in fucking prison for 27 fucking years of his life, 
Now, the Sinaloa and Gallardo and the Mexican cartels, that's where the cocaine went to, started coming into through Mexico. The Caribbean cannabis, the Jamaican, the, the, um, the, um, the Colombian and shit, where does it start going to now? North America and into Europe is where that market went. <laughs> Our market became brickweed, which we became the name of Mexican um, marijuana. It was called mids. It wasn't it was wasn't really potent, but it was good enough shit. I mean, it was decent enough bud. But it wasn't too long after that in 1980 in 1996 is when California became medically legal. And the three counties in Northern California, Trinity, Humboldt, and Mendocino counties, is called the Emerald Triangle. That's where all the mom and pop and the old 60s growers and people like that were from, you know, growing it out in the nowhere land. And they're just primo fucking shit. They already had their hands in on it. So when the, when the, um, Caribbean marijuana dried up when they took us out of the picture and the paradigm shift became the Colombian cartels and the Mexicans, um, that's when California took over and then the advent of homegrown weed and everybody's growing their own stuff now, plus they're smoking mids and this kind of shit. Well, at the more and more marijuana became legal in the United States, the less and less people wanted that shit from Mexico. So ultimately now what's taking place is because there's so many states in the United States that are either legal or are medical. I'm medical in, Calif in, 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 in Florida. Dude, I've got a fucking card right now that says... I can go into, I mean, the irony. I mean, just think about this shit. They want to put me away for life, you know, for, for bringing marijuana into this country. And here I am 30-something years later, and I can drive a mile down the street and buy it across the counter at a fucking store. <laughs> <laughs> Is that some shit? <laughs> or I can sit here in New York... <laughs> where it's legal and do that. <laughs> and I was going away for life for this fucking shit, man. And so, I mean, this is, this is, this is irony at its best. When did, how was life when you get out of prison? Life getting out of prison was, <sighs> did you ever think about going back to the old life? Well, no, God, no, no, Why? no, no, no. Well, well, for one thing, the sentencing, the life sentences. And for another thing, there was no more forgiveness beyond that point because what the federal judge told me, Elizabeth Kavakovich, I see this bitch's face in my mind every time I say her name, man. She was a son of a bitch, man. And she looked me dead in the eye, brother, and she said, Mr. McBride, if I ever see or hear of you in any courtroom in this country for this type of thing ever again, I will see that you're warehoused for the rest of your life. And I said, yes, ma'am, you won't see my ass again. <laughs> What's your biggest regret in life? Biggest regret. I don't know that I have one, to be quite honest with you. I'd have to give that some serious thought because regret is something that I never felt I needed to hold on to, particularly within the, the boundaries of my life. It was my life. It was what I did. Why should I turn around and regret my fucking life? My one shot at this time on this planet. I don't regret a fucking thing that I've done. If I had the chance to do it again, I'd do it again. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm just that kind of guy. And, and the, you know, it's, it's people like that, that that make this world what it is. You know, if it wasn't the persistent nature of the prohibitionists, you know, doing what they needed to do here in the United States to keep alcohol, you know, their favorite beverage alive. Um, the area I come from has a history that goes back to the privateer days when the East Indies, the Dutch East Indies uh, Corporation was running the Caribbean, you know, in the, in the 1600s or so when the pirates were taking and seizing ships and their shit. They were hiding among the 10,000 islands in Everglades City in Chukaluski. Well... History, you know, continues on to the rum running days when prohibition happens here in the United States in the 20s. And they're running rum from Cuba and from Jamaica into South Florida. Where in the fuck are they bringing it? Through Chukaluski Pass to Chukaluski to Everglades and, and out of there. And who's doing it? Joseph Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy family. He was a rum runner. 
He made millions. The only difference between that fucking guy and me, they let him keep his fucking money, and he bought his son the presidency with it. <laughs> Where do you go forward for the future, Tom? Where do I go forward? I go forward into you know, uh, doing exactly what I'm doing, trying to educate people about how the industry was done in the day when most people conceived it as a violent industry. Well, like I told you earlier, nothing could be further from the fucking truth, man. I mean, the violence doesn't occur until it gets down to the smaller guys in the in the other cities across the United States when they buy, you know, two or three tons of in, in cash and they've got all of their money tied up in that and they're fronting in here, fronting in here, and you don't pay them, they're going to come after you to get their fucking money. That's how it starts. These are the gang-banging motherfuckers are going to start killing and shooting at one another over, you know, eight, ten pounds of weed. That's where the violence begins, from the ignorant fuckers like that. But when it comes to the people on the upper end of it, like uh, like we were doing, there was just too much money to be made. And it too too much money, even even if, if loads were lost, it didn't matter. You know, so that's why kids like us could grow up in this industry doing what we were doing. And, you know, thank God that the, that the United States government recognized that simple fact that we, though, they stopped getting adults. <laughs> now they're getting all kids. <laughs> they must be running out. I mean, this has got to be the end of it, you know, is what I'm thinking. So, you know, when I think back on that and I think back about regret and I don't think about, you know, I, you know, I, I can't even go there for some reason, because, you know, when I think back about what I've done and the outcome, I'm sitting here talking with you right now, brother. This is the greatest <laughs> fucking thing in the world. <laughs> and I aspire to telling this story because nobody's ever going to tell you this story. My book is a required historical textbook for one of South Florida's universities, right where I live, my hometown, my hometown university. My book is textbook. Where can people buy your book? My book is available um, through many different uh, ways. If you can look up online through any through bookstores and through other channels, but on, even on Amazon uh, and maybe um, in the UK, I know it's in a number of uh, countries throughout Europe um, on Amazon and things like that. But um, I'm sure there's some place in there, you know, a bookstore. Even go to a local bookstore, or whatever, have them order it for you. you well, know. Would, would it be turning this into a movie? Um, yeah, we're working on that. Actually, I'm writing as as we speak. I just got done moving. Uh, my daughter and I moving into a new home, so I'm going to get settled down and write what's called a story arc. I'm going to start, you know, a, a, just a brief, you know, maybe 25 pages or so of how to begin and how to get through and how to end. And um, the guy that I'm working with, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Stephen Machat, who actually has the number one book on Amazon right now, calling "Unraveling the Bible." And it has to deal with the uh, origins of mankind on Earth. Very compelling, very interesting, very brilliant man. He's a uh, entertainment mogul. He owns his own record company. He's a world-renowned and it's very sought-after film producer and, and um, filmmaker. And he's been doing it for 50 fucking years. And he's an, he's an, he's an artist attorney on top of it. I took him and, his, him and his son out on an Everglades back roads, backwoods airboat ride that's off the grid that nobody ever gets, and we became just the dearest friends over it. And he manages everything that I do. He looks after my best interests when it comes to that stuff. But, um, you know, and it's just getting around and telling this story. And people should hear this story. They should understand, you know, the humble beginnings of cannabis in this country, particularly if you're, you know, if you're a, an American and you're listening to this cast or somewhere where uh, marijuana might be quasi legal in some fashion or is, you know, leaning governments are leaning toward being legal. They should understand that there is absolutely a nonviolent way that this industry can be handled. And America has figured it out. You know, it's no longer the, the, the pistol in your face kind of organization that people have this preconceived notion of. You know, it's more of a it's a business now. And it's not, and it's been discovered now also that cannabis is not just a recreational, you know, um, form of uh, entertainment, but it does have medicinal value. You know, um, the cannabinoids that are associated with um, cannabis, and um, there's too many for me to name or to even count right now. But if people can understand just this one simple thing, and then I'll I'll, I'll let you go ahead and end this thing if you like, is that. Um, Every mammal on the planet Earth has within their body what's called an endocannabinoid system. And the only thing that can react or bind with the synapse of that 
or of that structure within your body is the consumption of THC. You consume THC and your body does what's called endogenously. That's why it's called um, um, in, um, in, um, within your body. It's, it's done endogenously. It's like when you eat sugar, it's immediately turned to glucose and your body turns it into a useful form. When you ingest THC of any quantity, your body converts it into a useful, a useful form by way of a, um, a, a, a neurochemical signature that seeks out every unhealthy cell in your body and literally gives it instructions to commit suicide. It's a very amazing miracle uh, that was discovered by a, a, a wonderful woman in, at the University of Competence in Spain. And... Um, um, She's just a very brilliant researcher. She took off from some research by a guy, um, an Israeli scientist by the name of uh, Mac, um, um, Raphael Macholm. He's the one that originally isolated and named the THC cannabinoid, the molecule tetrahydrocannabinol. She was farting around one day with her models, and she was, uh, you know, their team was discovering tried different ways of how to abate cancer or kill cancer cells or tumors and things of that nature. They decided one day to just introduce THC into one of their models. They immediately discovered that it was killing the cancer cells, and they were onto something. That was the beginning of the, you know, the, you know, the the downfall of the skull and crossbone attached to cannabis, and the the red cross now attached to it, meaning that it does have medicinal value, and then the United States government was making it illegal and touting it, making it a Schedule One narcotic along with acid and heroin, you know, and and dangerous drugs like that because they were saying it has no medicinal value and it has a propensity for abuse. Well, nothing could even be further from the truth again because, you know, dude, I can show you documents right now where our United States government holds two use patents on cannabinoids from cannabis, and they list their diseases that they can cure. Our government owns the fucking patents on the cannabinoids. The plant can't be kept patented because it's a product of nature, and because it's a product of nature, pharmaceutical companies don't want to have anything to do with it if you can't patent it. So you're stuck paying $20,000 for chemotherapy when in reality it can cost you about $2,500 and you can cure cancer with $2,500. It's an amazing prospect, but that's a whole other world to be you know, speaking of. No, but listen, man, it's an important one. Obviously, the cannabis oils and stuff is curing tumors, cancers. It is. It's, um, but again, I believe every plant on this planet can cure something. Anything grown from this earth can cure something. Yep. I believe even fruit and veggies. Right. There's a... If you look at carrots, and you, it's the same as your eyes, and you've got different fruits and veggies, exactly. Different organs there you in the go. Body. There you yeah, go. Listen, the different but, nutrients and different. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, um, but you know yourself, the pharmaceutical industry is the biggest organization on the planet. Yeah, they don't create cures; they create customers. No, they create customers and they create wealth among themselves. Yeah. You know, and the quite the plain and simple fact <laughs> is this, and it's and it's easy enough, and anybody with a half a fucking brain can understand this. This this simple fact. If every mammal on this planet has a cannabinoid system within their body, and if the only chemical that can activate that super immune system within your body is the conversion of THC into a useful form that your body can send to these neurons and make them fire, we are by very nature designed to have a symbiotic relationship with this plant. If the only thing that will that will ignite that superhuman um, immune system in your body is a cannabinoid from that plant, well, then goddamn yeah, we're supposed to be having a we're supposed to be consuming that plant. That's how the Chinese figured it out nearly seven thousand fucking years ago. They're watching the animals eat the shit. And well, if the animals can eat it, and they're and they're not dying from it, and they're running around and they're feeling well, let's you know give it a shot. So that's I mean that's just how it shit begins. And at that same thing, I'm trying to think about the who was the first motherfucker that ever ate an oyster. <laughs> can you imagine? I Let's swore. just eat this fucker and see what it's all. <laughs> Tell me this time, through the life that you've led, the millions that you've made, being in prison, all the dark shit that comes with that life of smuggling, but do you miss it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I gotta tell you, you some of this. the some of the craziest <laughs> fucking shit we ever got into is out there amongst all of that. You know, I mean, some of the people that you run into from all over the Caribbean. You know, just all part of a team. You know, 
And like I said, it's not like go out there and, you know, hey, buddy, how you doing? I'm Tim. You know, it's work, work, work. And when you pull away, it's everybody you're hanging off the side of the boat screaming, yariba, yariba, andale, andale, andale. You know, they're part of the team. Go, go, go. You know, it's just, it's just that way. And it's cool as fuck. I met a group of guys that uh, the captain was a Dutch captain from the south end of St. Martin. Uh, his first mate was Frenchman from the north end of St. Martin. And the second mate was a Rasta dude from a Rastafarian from Jamaica. Well, they get hung up during bad weather and they're hung over in, in uh, British Honduras at that time before it was Belize. And the Frenchman's in a card game and he wins this juvenile orangutan in a cage. He wins him in a poker game. So he brings the fucking cage and puts it on the boat, and they you know the weather clears up, and they're loaded. We got to come and unload these motherfuckers. Well, they got this fucking orangutan offshore off the boat. They figure, oh, well, he ain't going anywhere. Let's let him out of the cage, right? So they let this fucking orangutan out. He isn't, he isn't, but you know, standing on the table, fuck, he couldn't have been maybe you know three feet tall, a meter tall, just a little guy. Right? <laughs> so we pull up there to unload, and we get next to the boat like this shit. And here's this goddamn thing swinging on the antennas and shit. And we're wondering what the fuck. And he swings over, and he jumps over, and he grabs onto our big antennas, and he's swinging. We're just loading. You know, we're doing our thing. We're not paying attention anymore to that fucking... The other Dutch captain called him a monkey. So we get ready to throw our lines. We got our load. We're all fucking heavy, and we're loaded down. And the captain, he's yelling over the rail. He goes, in a Dutch accent, he says, you boys, uh, you boys over there, he says, you go ahead and keep that there monkey. And I'm like, we're looking up and like, here he is up on our fucking low ran antenna, the, the biggest antenna on the boat. He's up on the top of that fucker and he's going back and forth with the swells like this. <laughs> and we're thinking, you know, we don't want this fucking thing. You know, what the hell are we going to do with a goddamn monkey or a fucking orangutan, right? So the boat just happens to swing over away from their boat. And as it came back and it, and at the apex of that fucking swing, that fucking ape let go of the damn thing. And he went sailing and you could see his little hair, like his cape. Flying through here, dude. He lands right on the chest of that captain, and his little hand like feet grab his lapels, and he starts like a fucking freestyle swimmer. And he's bit slapping the shit out of this fucking captain, screaming, Wah! like this. We put it in gear and pulled away, and I'm laughing my fucking ass off. And this monkey's bit slapping this fucking captain. And I'm thinking to myself, he's thinking, You ain't leaving me off this. You ain't leaving me on this fucking boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that was, I mean, it's just crazy ass shit, man. I mean, I could how go on forever. How much do you think you made through the years? In all those years? Oh, gosh. Man, that's really hard to tell. Millions. Maybe 40 million. Still a nice number. But I remember the amount of people that's working yeah, on this organization. You know, the thing about that is, and you know, when people talking about money... You know, and when you're when you're making sums of money like that, and you're not able to declare any of it, it's a real pain in the fucking dick. You know, because I was getting paid literally a lot of times. I'm getting paid with money that if you take it, you know, the bundles and you you fan through it like this, the dust and the mold mildew is coming out of it because it's just being exchanged in bundles and nobody's spending it. You know, I mean, that's just how the how much money there was, and. A lot of times what we would do is, you know, and people say, bury your money. Well, you don't bury the fucking money. For one thing, you might forget where you fucking put it. Second of all, you know, it you can't stick it in the ground because the ground is nasty and it's moist and it's wet and your money will rot and mold and shit or whatever the fuck. We figured out one day that um, we had uh, <coughs> two, two of the girls on the island every, every month or so, we would put you know, cash in paper bags, like a hundred thousand or 200,000 or whatever like that and write the number on it and put our name on it. And we'd all put our bags in the back of the truck and the girls would drive to Miami to a, a Cuban gold dealer. And he would sell us at that time. What was what the popular coins to be having were the you know, South African Krugerrand at that time we would buy Krugerrands or we would buy bars of gold ingots and change the cash into ingots. Now you can do whatever you want with them fucking things. What I wound up doing was putting them in a couple of strong boxes, um, putting heavy chains onto them and throwing them off the side of our seawall next to our boat into the water. 
<laughs> and if I ever needed money, I'd just dive off the seawall and go down and open the box and grab a handful of ingots, go to the bank and cash them in. You know, I could hide my money that way, you know, which was, you know, one way of doing it, but the cash was just, I mean, I had so much cash at one point and um, I was putting it in the attic and I went up one day to put more, another big box up in there and I'm looking and I see this pile of confetti and I'm thinking, what the fuck is this? It turned out to be $100 bills, a little over a quarter of a million dollars in $100 bills. These mice got a hold of it and dude, they didn't just tear pieces. They, they was working at that shit, man. They toured, I mean, you couldn't pass this shit together if you tried. And they made the coolest little condo out of this fucking money, dude. I was really impressed. And I, all I could do is laugh. I'm like, <laughs> look at this fucking thing, man. A condo they built out of it. I said, oh, that's a quarter of a million dollar condo. And I just grabbed it like this and threw it with all the other insulation and just set the box down. And I went down, I told my girlfriend, Lori, I said, we, I think we need an exterminator. <laughs> <laughs> you know? but, but the money, like I said, it was a pain in the ass. I mean, yeah. you can only spend so much, you know, but the work was fun. Yeah. I mean, it was just a blast to do, man. We knew how to do it. We were considered, um, what we were doing was considered one of the most sophisticated smuggling organizations ever discovered. And this is how it was touted. And I don't pat myself on the back for all of this. I mean, I didn't do it alone. I mean, and I need everybody to understand this. You know, I I can sit here and 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 tell you about how it all worked, but it wasn't just me, man. There are hundreds of other brass bald men and women that just made this shit happen. And God bless their asses. They took their lumps like everybody else did when the whole shit came tumbling down. You know, and everybody, pretty, for the most part, kept their mouth shut when needed to be shut and, and took their lumps and just did what we had to do. But everybody's out of prison. And, you know, I did four years. I was one of the, I, I was one of the ones to do the most time, you know, simply because of who I was and what I had to do, to, you know, to get my ass out. But that being said, you know, uh, if it were not for all these other people, then you wouldn't be hearing the story. None of this would have taken yeah. place. So I can't take the credit for all of this, you know. Tim, would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? Well, I don't know. Have you got any other questions you want to get answered? Anything bugging? Anything popping out? You no, know? I think you smashed it, mate. Like I say, it's a phenomenal story. You know I've got nothing but love for you, brother. Oh, Yo, uh, man. You know what? God bless you for having me over, dude. You know, and yeah. sometimes I don't know what the fuck you're saying. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's just part of the game that everybody plays. But, you know, my man, I, I can't thank you so much for having me up here to fucking Times Square dude of all places you know it's just the greatest place to be in the world you know i've never been to new york been all over the world but i've never been to new york city and this man was kind enough to you know to bring me up and you know let me have a you know blast off my you know off my big fat <laughs> doobie here and you know and just tell you guys a story that you're never going to hear unless you read my book or you can find me on instagram at original saltwater cowboy look me up I post a lot of stuff about what I do. There's very little personal stuff in there. I don't get personal and stuff like that. Well, you can look me up online, Tim McBride forward slash Everglades. You can check out everything that I've done, you know, as far as news goes and, you know, interviews and things of that nature. And by all means, um, you know, check this guy's podcast out wherever you get yours, man. You know, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever it may be, you know, and, uh, um, subscribe because he's an awesome <laughs> dude, man. He has some awesome guests. Tim, absolutely love you, brother. Thanks for coming on and telling your story. Oh, I man, enjoyed I that. enjoy a shit out yeah. of it every time I do this. Yeah. And it just comes right from here and it goes right to you, man. You know, and I know a lot of you are out there going, yeah, oh, fuck yeah, right, sure, okay. <laughs> but you know what? All I do is, and I have to end by saying, don't take my fucking word for it. Look this shit up. Look up Everglades City, Florida. Look up the history of smuggling in Everglades City. Look up Tim McBride slash Everglades. Read all this shit. I'm not the only one, man. I mean, it. all the validation you need to val validate whatever came out of my fucking mouth just now, you can find it all for yourself. You know, Tim, but, listen, brother, again, nothing again, but love for you, Thank mate, you. And I'll speak to you soon. Take God care, bless everybody. You. Love you, man. <laughs>